Chapter One I stopped at the ancient stone fence and took a deep breath, running my fingers over the feathery yellow moss running like cobwebs across the mottled surface. The dry country landscape stretching before me was nothing like the bustling city of Sydney. For a start, there was no traffic noise, just the clanging of an ancient windmill and the racket of several kookaburras arguing over their prey. I hoped their prey was a simple mouse and not a venomous snake. And while the air here was definitely cleaner than city air, the curious cows staring at me over the fence had a pungent aroma all of their own. I swatted at a huge blowfly that had left them to buzz around my head. I wondered if I would be able to adjust to life in the country. Still, I'd had no option but to leave Sydney. The divorce was fresh and painful, yet every day I got just a little bit happier. I wasn't sure why I had been so upset about dumping a man who had cheated on me, but I figured it had something to do with the fact that we had been married five years. Old habits die hard. At least the ache was now a dull thud and not a searing pain. I was also on a tight budget, as my property settlement had not yet come through. My ex-husband's family was extremely wealthy, and he was doing everything he could to stop me getting as much as a cent. That is, with one exception, he had offered to pay for six months' rent and had even suggested the cottage in Little Tatterford to me. Apparently one of his colleagues had recommended it to him. I knew this would have been on the advice of his expensive lawyers, not out of any sense of kindness on his part. I had filled my van with my belongings, such as they were, and had driven to the Australian country town of Little Tatterford, which, if what I had read online was correct, had a population of fewer than 4,000 people, rather a change from the five million of Sydney. I smiled as I thought of my new home, which would only be a short distance away from where I stood, hidden behind a stand of eucalyptus trees. My home was to be a cosy one-bedroom cottage that was a good deal smaller than my previous home, and it didn't have my ex-husband in it, but that was a plus. This style of house is known as a Victorian miner's cottage, and they are generally quite pretty with lots of character. I had been told that mine had an open fireplace in the living room and was situated on the corner of a large tract of land owned by a woman named Cressida Upthorpe. One other building sat on the land, only a stone's throw from my new cottage, a large two-story residence that Cressida Upthorpe operated as a boarding house. It was afternoon, the sun hanging in the sky just over the mountains on the horizon, throwing thin shadows across the ground. I turned to my new van and admired the words I had airbrushed onto it. Sybil's Mobile Pet Grooming. I knew the name wasn't at all clever or original in the least, but customers would be left in no doubt as to the nature of my business. I made my way to the van, threw the door open, and took a look inside at everything that I owned. I sighed, trying to forget the fact that I was divorced at 27 and had moved to the country just to get away from my ex-husband. I was farther from my mother and didn't even know how far away my sister Fito was, as she was teaching in the city of Al Ain in the United Arab Emirates. The air was cool and crisp, quite a difference from the humid coastal air I was used to, where jackets were more for looks than they were for function. The few leaves left on the trees ranged from red to gold, all the colours of an Aussie sunset on a dusty horizon. This was a new start, I reminded myself, a life of peace and quiet. I was looking forward to moving everything into the cottage, despite the fact I knew it would be countless hours getting everything unpacked and putting it where I wanted. I had thought my belongings were few, but moving house always revealed just how many possessions one actually had. I needed groceries too, but there was no time for that now. After the weekend, I planned to drive my van downtown and park on the main street that ran through the centre of Little Tatterford and make a start building a customer base. I had been encouraged when I had driven through the main street earlier as I counted no fewer than 12 people out and about walking their dogs. But first, 
I wanted to walk down the gravel path towards the residence and say hello to Cressida Upthorpe, since I hadn't even met the woman yet. I needed to get my keys. I'd had a number of lively discussions with Cressida through email and had spoken to her on the phone. I wanted to know if my mental idea of Cressida's appearance would match up with what she looked like in reality. I pictured her as short and plump, with white hair pulled back severely, kindly, yet quite eccentric. The sun was starting to fall further in the sky, and the cold wind had picked up with a vengeance. Halfway to the boarding house, I found myself wishing I had thought to bring a far thicker coat. I'd been warned about the weather up here in the mountains, but I wasn't prepared for the bite in the air. I picked up the pace, walking with my hands in my pockets and my eyes on the trees above. Here and there, a leaf detached from a brown stem and fluttered slowly to the ground. It was the end of autumn and fast heading into winter. There was the boarding house, sitting in the fields like something out of an old movie. I shuddered and pulled a face. It's more like the scary house Manderley from the old gothic film Rebecca, rather than one of the lovely mansions from Pride and Prejudice, I muttered aloud to myself. I hesitated by the pomegranate tree. Who knew these grew in the mountains and bore fruit at this time of year? I reached out my hand instinctively for one of the glossy red fruits, and then snatched it back. If I ate the fruit, would I, like Persephone, be trapped here forever, she in Hades and me in Little Tatterford? A strange feeling washed over me. I shook my head and continued down the path. I was being fanciful. I'd always had an affinity with Greek mythology, and sometimes that made my imagination run away on its own course. The boarding house was imposing. Made of wood with grand masonry insets, it had delicate white iron latticework on all the balconies. That was where the good ended. It also looked gloomy and had an uncared-for air about it. I would not have been the least bit surprised if it had been used as a haunted house on a movie set. There was a small gravel drive coming from a larger road that ran perpendicular to the one on which I walked, and there were a few cars parked along it. I climbed the creaky wooden steps to the front porch. I was about to knock on the front door when it was pulled open with some speed from the other side. I found myself staring at a woman. This had to be the boarding house's owner, Cressida Upthorpe. She was short, for I had that much right, but she was stick thin and had bright red hair cut in a short bob that had probably been stylish in the sixties. She wore enormous red framed glasses and had makeup caked impressively onto her face. Impressively in this case, meaning it was impressive that the weight of all the makeup didn't force her head to fall off her shoulders. And that was when she thrust a large crocodile skin handbag at me and said, Take this! There's been a murder! Chapter Two The woman then ran down the pathway to a car. The engine roared to life, and I watched her speeding down the drive, her tires spun, throwing up a plume of smoke. For a moment I stood there, dumbstruck, not knowing what to do. To my relief, a tall, portly man appeared in the foyer beyond the front door. Hi, I'm Sybil Potts, I said. Was that Cressida Upthorpe who just ran past me? The man nodded solemnly. Hello, Miss Potts, or may I call you Sybil? I nodded. Sure. Welcome to Little Tatterford. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Mr. Buttons, one of the permanent residents here. His accent was clipped and of a posh Oxbridge English. He looked to be in his fifties or sixties, his hair pitch black except for the grey at the temples. His nose was long and curved, and his shoulders sharp and sloping. He wore a dress shirt and black dress pants, and his shoes were so shiny I could almost see my reflection in them. I was more than a little confused. Excuse me, but Cressida Upthorpe just said there was a murder? Mr. Buttons adjusted his glasses. Yesterday I drew the Tower, Judgment, and the Ten of Swords. I suspected something like this would happen. 
Whether it is murder or not, I cannot say, but there is indeed a body in the storage room. My jaw fell open, and I wondered why the man would mention tarot cards at such a time as this. A dead body? Here? But why did Miss Upthorpe run away? To fetch the police. A local police officer lives but three minutes from here. Mr. Buttons went back inside the house, and I followed him. I kept pace with him as he walked across the foyer, heading for a door off to the side marked no entry, in writing scrawled on an angle. Mr. Buttons flung open the door and I walked inside. At the end of the room, near another door, was a pair of legs, bare and hairy, laying on the floor. I couldn't see to whom they belonged, but I was reasonably sure it was the dead man. As I walked past an imposing table, I set down Cressida's large handbag and prepared myself. I had never seen a dead body before, and I didn't know what to expect. I took a deep breath, just before stepping around the table. Here was the body, although it looked as if the man could be sleeping. His eyes were closed, and he was dressed in blue boxer shorts and a white undershirt with no sleeves. He had no socks, and I could see that the nails of his toes and his hands were yellowing and brittle. Here he is, Mr. Buttons said needlessly, using a hand to indicate the general space of the body. Yes, I said, feeling the need to respond to Mr. Button's remark. I moved around the body, careful not to disturb anything, but when I looked up, I saw that Mr. Buttons was adjusting some silverware on the table. Should you be touching that? I asked. The British man looked at me and lifted a thin black brow. It's such a mess in here. I narrowed my eyes. It might be a crime scene. On CSI, you know, the TV show, they say people mustn't touch crime scenes. Mr. Buttons appeared puzzled. A crime scene? Are you certain? There's no knife jutting from his back and no sign of a struggle. He scratched his chin. I know Cressida told you there was a murder, but the dear lady has an undeniable flair for the dramatic. I'm sure it's simply a natural death. Mr. Higgins was only around fifty years of age, but he'd been quite unwell for some time. I shook my head. Really, that's up to the police to decide. Well, I won't tidy up the body then, I suppose. Mr. Button said with disappointment in his voice and a shrug of his sloping shoulders, but then he lifted a silver candle holder that had fallen and placed it the right way up. Why didn't Miss Upthorpe just call the police? I asked. Blake Wesley, who lives just around the corner, is the police here, the man said. There's just him and one constable. Really? I asked, surprised. Still, Little Tatterford was a small town. As I watched, a fat, tabby and white cat came slinking out of the shadowy corner towards me and meowed. I bent and let the cat sniff my hand, before sliding my finger up to his head where I scratched him softly. Lord Farrington, Mr. Buttons said with fondness, I do love that cat. He seems nice, I said lamely, and Mr. Buttons didn't reply. Who was the man? I pointed at the corpse. Tim Higgins, a fellow boarder, the Englishman said. He was a pleasant enough gentleman, and he kept to himself, but I think he had a little too much admiration for Cressida. I raised my brows. Cressida, I mean, Miss Upthorpe? I wasn't sure how I should be referring to her. Mr. Buttons appeared not to hear me. He was worried about his heart, so he was on a diet. I glanced quickly at the body again. The man was not fat, but he was not fit, as he had a belly, a line of which peeked out from under the bottom of his undershirt. He was completely bald, although he had a moustache, all white and bushy above his lips. I frowned. There's no blood or anything, I said. Like you said, there's no sign of a struggle, but the silverware was knocked over. He might have flung out his hand as he fell, perhaps from a heart attack. Mr. Buttons said, he hadn't been well lately. He'd been acting erratically too, dizzy and confused. Maybe he wasn't eating enough since he was on a diet, or maybe he had early onset dementia. 
there was a lot of walking around like this in his underwear, even though it was well past morning. He often didn't show up at mealtimes. I frowned. Dizzy and confused, you say? I took another look at the dead man. His face was indeed bright red. It all added up. I kneeled down and bent over the man, smelling near his mouth. It smelt of bitter almonds. Cyanide, I pronounced. Chapter Three Cyanide, a man's voice repeated. I looked up as Cressida Upthorpe swept into the dining room, followed by a man who could not have been older than thirty and was as good-looking as men came. His hair was brown and kept short, his eyes a piercing blue. He had a dimple in his right cheek that was present even with his serious police officer face. He wore a T-shirt and jeans, so he clearly hadn't been on duty. I couldn't help but notice he didn't appear to have a gun. If I had seen him anywhere else, I never would have guessed he was a cop. I had no time to study the man further, as he addressed us sharply, Away from the body, you two. Mr. Buttons took my arm, and the two of us moved against the wall to stand in front of a huge, gilt-framed painting. The cop crouched down and looked at the body. What can you tell me about him, Mr. Buttons? I noticed he hadn't asked Ms. Upthorpe, and I was sure that had been intentional. He's been unwell lately, dizzy, confused, that kind of thing. The cop nodded. I'll call a doctor. A doctor? But he's dead. I was unable to help my outburst. The man turned to me. A doctor will examine the body and decide if he died of natural causes. I shook my head and took a step forward. But I smelt cyanide by his mouth. The cop narrowed his eyes at me. So you said. He bent down and inhaled. I can't smell a thing. I resisted the urge to roll my eyes. It's a genetic thing. Despite what you see on TV, only a small percentage of people have the ability to smell the bitter almond scent of cyanide. The cop looked me up and down as if he were examining a particularly strange sort of insect. And you know this because cyanide is hardly freely available. You can't just walk into a store and buy it. His tone was full of disbelief and bordering on the derogatory. My ex-husband is a chemical engineer, I said, doing my best to keep my tone even. He works for one of the mining companies manufacturing sodium cyanide. The cop looked at me again. You are saying that you can smell it? I nodded. I've never heard of that, he said, standing straight. You'll be renting the cottage here, won't you? I nodded. Yes, I'm Sybil Potts. The cop folded his arms across his chest. Sergeant Blake Wesley. All right, everyone needs to get out of here, but stay in the house until I take your statements. Would you all please go and wait in the dining room? I have to secure the scene. I turned with the others and left, noticing that the fat cat had followed me out. I bent and picked him up, holding him in one arm and stroking his back with my free hand. Interesting the British man said as we walked. You smell to poison. I nodded. Yes, I'd know that smell anywhere. My handbag, Ms. Upthorpe said, turning and hurrying back into the entrance hall. When she returned, she had the handbag over her shoulder and a set of keys in her hand. Here you are, Sybil. Quite the excitement for your first day. Please do be careful and come up whenever you like. Dinner is at 5.30 in winter and 6 in summer, and you're welcome to come and join us any time. Thank you, I said, wondering if it was too late to cancel my lease. I'd come here for peace and quiet, and the people I'd met so far had been either eccentric or bordering on rude. I bent to release the cat, but Ms. Upthorpe stopped me. Please take Lord Farrington outside, Sybil. He says he's quite disturbed by seeing the dead body. Had I stepped into an insane asylum, I shook my head, certain I had fallen into a parallel world. Or perhaps I hadn't heard her properly. Surely Cressida didn't believe that the cat actually spoke to her. As I took the purring cat to the front door, I saw Blake Wesley and a uniformed cop fastening yellow and black tape with the words, 
crime scene, do not enter, around the outside of the door to the storage room. I'll interview the three boarders who found the body, Sergeant Wesley said to the uniformed officer, if you wouldn't mind waiting here at the door for the forensics team to arrive. The uniformed police officer agreed, but I noted he looked quite irritated. Back in Sydney, our station had its own forensics team, he said. Sergeant Wesley said, yes, well, that would be nice, but the nearest team is in Tamworth, 50 minutes away. I put the cat on the ground outside the door, shut the door firmly, and turned around. I jumped when I saw that the sergeant was standing right behind me. What are you doing out here? You were told to wait in the dining room. His tone overflowed with disapproval. Miss Upthorpe told me to put the cat outside, I said, unhappy that my voice sounded defensive. Sergeant Wesley narrowed his eyes in response and nodded in the direction of the hallway. I hurried away, feeling like a naughty schoolgirl who had just been sent to the principal. Thankfully, Mr. Buttons was waiting for me. This way to the dining room, he said. This house is so rambling that it would be easy to get lost. Rambling was not the adjective I would have chosen. I could think of several, and none of them polite. I shuddered as I thought that Norman Bates certainly could have been comfortable in the house. It looked as if it wouldn't have been out of place in any old thriller. I drew a deep breath and took in my surroundings. The place smelt of old dust and mustiness. The dim hallway was lined with garish, bright pink wallpaper with white flowers speckled across it. Paintings in somber black frames, all of them hanging at angles, lined the walls. There were several colorful landscapes and a strange one of a young woman crying tears of blood as she held a single vivid red rose. Cressida Upthorpe paints these herself, Mr. Buttons said, nodding his head to a picture of a sailboat crashing into rocks and people falling overboard. Oh, yes, um, they're good, I said, pretending to admire the bizarre paintings. Mr. Buttons chuckled and then stopped in front of the second door down on the left. It was closed tightly, but opened freely, despite there being a small keyhole under the brass knob. Mr. Buttons pushed the door open and stepped inside, and I followed him in. The room was freezing, and I wrapped my coat around me tightly. Everyone had warned me that little Tatterford was cold, but I had no idea just how cold it was. Coming from the sunny coast, I was unprepared for the brutal bite of cold in the air. It was not even winter yet, and winter was not my favorite season. I didn't mind it being cold outside if I was in a warm house, but this large, rambling house was not warm, and I very much doubted my cottage would be warm either. I figured I was in the winter of my life, emotionally speaking, and soon would be heading for spring, or so I hoped. I always tried to look on the bright side of things. We stepped through the door into a dining room with a long, polished table of cherry wood that could easily seat at least twenty. The room was large, but it was filled with plenty of clutter, or rather, antiques. Things were not arranged in an attractive manner, but were simply crammed one against the other. There was a faded green antique love seat in the far corner, tucked in under a window where the sun came in and fell along the bottom half of its worn upholstery. Across the room was an imposing mahogany credenza, and beside it, in another corner, sat a frayed and patched reclining chair. It was difficult to identify the other furniture, as stacks of antique china and glassware covered every available space. Mr. Buttons crossed to the large dining table and sat down. I sat opposite him. The dining table was well dusted, but as the sunlight shone through the small window, Particles of dust were easily seen, suspended in the air. The decidedly musty smell continued into this room, and I wished I could open all the windows so fresh air could flood in. Cressida Upthorpe peered in from the doorway and then crossed to the table to take her place. I've been eavesdropping on what the police are saying, she announced proudly with an accompanying wave of both hands. I took the chance to study her, she had bright red hair and oversized bright red-framed glasses. I had noticed that before. Who wouldn't? 
but now I took in her long blue velvet dress trimmed with golden brocade. I wondered if she had been on stage at some point in her life, as the entire effect was theatrical. I didn't quite know how to respond to her words, so asked, How many police officers are out there now? Only two, Cressida said. Blake Wesley is the sergeant in charge of the police station here in Little Tatterford. There are two constables, Gordon Wright and Bill Barnes, though there is only supposed to be one constable on duty. Bill's on sick leave and won't be coming back. And Gordon is new, but he's only temporary. He replaced the other sergeant, Colin. Colin was a large man, and a heart attack ended up doing him in, right as he was midway through an upsized double burger meal. Blake's still getting used to working with Gordon, because Gordon is from the city and has no understanding of country ways. Why, the other day, Gordon booked a local farmer for driving straight across a public road to get from one of his paddocks to the other, just because he didn't have a license. I nodded, trying to take it all in and failing. My head was spinning. What did you hear them say? Mr. Buttons leant forward in his chair, making it squeak loudly, and I wondered if the old chairs were actually practical or whether Mr. Buttons was about to be deposited in a heap on the floor. Cressida looked discomforted for a moment before she spoke. Sorry, Sybil, but Blake told the constable, Gordon, that you were pretty, although he was disappointed to find out that you're a nut job. He said you'd fit right in with the other eccentric residents at the Upthorpe boarding house. At that, Mr. Buttons gasped. How rude, and I thought he was a pleasant young man. I'll go and make us all a nice cup of tea. I put my head in my hands and rubbed my temples to offset the headache that was coming on. I feel I'm going mad, I thought. Mr. Buttons and Cressida Upthorpe are really strange, and that police officer is just plain rude. What on earth have I got myself into by moving here? He said that there was no way that people could smell cyanide, Cressida continued, after Mr. Buttons had left the dining room. And there was no way it was genetic, but that he didn't have any time to worry about that at the moment. I was furious. I wanted to march straight into the crime scene and set that smug officer straight. How dare he call me a nut job? Cressida appeared not to notice my discomfort, and she continued talking. Blake's called the forensics team and detectives, but they're at least 50 minutes away. She paused to smile. Gordon seems quite put out that the forensics team's so far away. He keeps going on about the fact that there was one at his old station in Sydney. I think Blake's going to have trouble with him. City slickers, she added derisively. At that point, a woman hurried into the room and addressed Cressida without as much as a glance at me. Miss Upthorpe, whatever's happened? Why are the police here? Cressida leaped to her feet. Sit down, Alison. She all but pushed the woman into the closest chair. I'm afraid I have some awful news. Mr. Higgins is dead. Tim? Alison's hands flew to her throat. What happened? He's dead. Cressida crossed to a tall cedar chiffonier pushed aside the scary-looking Victorian porcelain dolls perched on top of it, and then produced a box of tissues with a flourish. She thrust a bunch of crumpled tissues into the woman's hands. The police are treating it as a suspicious death, she said. I overheard Gordon saying it was probably a heart attack, and Blake saying that he could well be right. But Blake said that they won't know for sure until the forensics team gets here. I looked at Alison. To my relief, the woman didn't appear to be eccentric, although who would know what would eventually prove to be the case. She looked about fifty or so, around the same age as my estimate for Cressida, and was slim and well-groomed. Unlike Cressida, however, Alison appeared to be conservative. Her shiny brown hair was pulled back into a ponytail, and her jewellery, although it looked expensive, was subtle. I figured the gold fob chain around her neck would be worth at least $3,000. My ex-mother-in-law had often told me, or rather gloated to me, about the value of her own jewellery and antiques. Cressida was still talking. It could be murder. Alison wrung her hands in obvious discomfort. 
Poor Mr. Higgins has been unwell. Surely they don't think someone murdered him. Mr. Buttons chose that moment to return with the tray. He placed a delicate, pale green teapot on the table with four cups and saucers and a matching cream jug and sugar. Next to the cups, he placed a row of sandwiches cut into small triangles with the crusts removed. Cucumber sandwiches, he said. Tea and cucumber sandwiches are always cheering. He turned to the new arrival. I saw you coming down the stairs, Alison, so I brought you a cup too. How is your migraine? Alison frowned. It's eased off now, thanks. And you've met Sibyl, Mr. Buttons continued. Cressida suddenly stood up. I'm so sorry, Alison. Allow me to present Sybil Potts, who will be renting the cottage. Sybil, this is Alison Turner, our maid. We nodded to each other and murmured greetings. I couldn't help but overhear what the police said, Mr. Buttons said. The forensics team just arrived, so when they were all inside the room, I pricked up my ears to see if I could overhear anything. And did you? Cressida said. Mr. Buttons nodded. Indeed, I did. Blake asked them if Tim Higgins could have been poisoned. At that, Alison gasped, and Cressida waved Mr. Buttons on. Then I overheard a man say that some poisons give a pretty clear indicator. He said there was no vomit in the passageway, so that discounts a few poisons. He said there's a nasty one that melts your tongue and throat if ingested, and that's not the case here either. He asked Blake if he was thinking of any poison in particular, and Blake said cyanide. Alison gasped again. I was pleased that it appeared that the cop had taken me seriously after all, at least to some degree. Cressida waved her hand at Mr. Buttons once more. Well, go on, Mr. Buttons. What did the man say to that? Mr. Buttons finished his cucumber sandwich before he answered. I couldn't hear too clearly, but I think he said they'd have to run tests. He said cyanide is usually very hard to detect. Anyway, you might be right after all, Sybil. Alison set down her teacup. Right about what? Oh, you don't know, do you? Cressida said. Sybil here says she can smell cyanide. Only a small percentage of people can smell it. Isn't that right, Sybil? I shrugged. I don't know what the percentage is, but it's a genetic ability, and so only some people can smell it. Alison simply nodded and sipped her tea. I put two spoons of sugar in my tea and then rapidly consumed a cucumber sandwich. It didn't taste too good, but I was hungry. Just as I stuffed a second cucumber sandwich in my mouth, the door opened. It was Sergeant Blake Wesley. Outside now, Miss Potts, please. Chapter Four I walked over to the dining room door, and Sergeant Wesley indicated that I should follow him. I soon found myself in the living room. It was much like every other room I had been in so far, a stale smell hanging in the air, and the room overcrowded with antiques. I leant against the doorframe and folded my arms across my chest. Come and sit down, the sergeant said. His tone now at least sounded like a request rather than an order. I crossed to an ugly, uncomfortable-looking chair and took my seat opposite Sergeant Wesley, who was already flipping open a notepad, pen in hand. I asked a member of the forensic team about that stuff you were talking about, the cyanide smell. And you discovered that I wasn't an eccentric nut job who was making something up, Sergeant Wesley? I was unable to keep the accusatory edge out of my voice. I was satisfied to see that the sergeant's face flushed red. Um, yes, he said. Sorry about that. I'd never heard that fact before, that only some people can smell cyanide. It's a good thing you mentioned it, as the pathologist said that they wouldn't normally do a toxicology screening for cyanide. If it does turn out to be cyanide, we'll have you to thank for discovering it. By the way, call me Blake. We're all on first name terms here in this town. Now, I need your full name, date of birth, and address. His face flushed again. Oh yes, your address is here, of course, the cottage. 
After I supplied him with the details, Blake continued. Now, tell me everything that happened from the time you arrived here this afternoon. Please make it as detailed as possible and leave nothing out, even if you consider it to be insignificant. For the next fifteen minutes I sat there, recounting my afternoon to Sergeant Blake Wesley. After he finished and advised me that I'd have to tell my story to the detectives as well when they arrived, he told me that I was free to go. I moved to the door, unsure of what to do with myself now, after such a strange and uncomfortable start to my new life in Little Tatterford. I was hungry, so I decided to do the mundane before seeing my cottage, to go into town and pick up a few groceries. I needed something to eat before I unpacked my things. I figured I could explore a bit and get some word of mouth going on my business. At least that would get my mind off the strange events of the day. I walked outside and thought that I would need to buy a scarf and perhaps some sort of warm hat. This cold air had a bite to it that had to be experienced to be believed, at least for a beachside city dweller like I had been. I had trouble collecting my thoughts, my mind leaping from one thing to another. I climbed into my van and headed into town. I pulled to a stop in front of the small grocery store, the only one in town, jumped out of my van and headed in. I was glad that there were three big parking spots outside the store, as the rest of the street had reverse angle parking. The main street was actually on a major highway that narrowed through town. There was no way I'd be able to reverse my van into one of those spots in the face of oncoming traffic. In fact, as I'd been driving down the street, I had seen a car with Queensland plates narrowly miss someone doing a reverse angle park. I figured they didn't have reverse angle parking in the northern state of Queensland. There were four checkout lines in the front of the store, and three were open, although there was no one checking out. Two of the clerks were younger, possibly school kids working after class, but one was an older man with thinning black hair and a smile on his face. Hi, the man said as I walked past him. I haven't seen you before. Are you passing through? No, I just moved here. I said, ah, you took Cressida Upthorpe's cottage. I nodded and then hurried to take a grocery cart from a small line. I pushed it towards the back of the store, wondering if the friendly description of people in small country towns was a polite way of saying extremely nosy. I spent half an hour selecting what I thought I needed. The necessities mainly, chocolate, ice cream, bread, milk and when I returned to the front, only the man was there. All finished, he asked, and I nodded. So what brings you here to Little Tatterford? He asked, as he scanned the groceries I had emptied from the cart. Divorce? I said. Oh, yes, divorce, he said. Nice van you have out there. It will get dusty soon, given that we need rain desperately. He nodded his head towards the window that ran almost the whole length of the front of the store. Do you have any pets? I asked. I have a pet grooming business. I do dog baths mainly, although I can do some show clips. The man muttered to himself as one of the items wouldn't scan. He punched some keys on his screen before answering. I have one old dog and my wife always complains about washing him. I might take you up on it. I loaded my groceries and then looked the bags over. I had forgotten to buy eggs and butter and goodness knows what else, but I could do that tomorrow. Right now, I just wanted to check out the cottage, pack the food away, bring my clothes in, get warm, eat something, and then lie down. When I finally reached my new home, I gasped in horror. I had seen photos of the cottage inside and out in the emails that my ex-husband Andrew had sent me, but it was altogether different in real life. I muttered some very rude things about that man under my breath. He had sent me photos of a different cottage. For one, this cottage was much smaller. It wasn't that I minded small as such. It would be easier to clean. The problem was that this cottage was no chocolate box Victorian miner's cottage, but rather something altogether more derelict. There was an old railed fence at the front of the house, but not in front of the carport that was near, but not attached to the house. 
At first glance, I realized that the carport roof was too low for my van, so I'd have to park it outside at the front of the cottage. An old iron water tank towered precariously above the cottage. It looked as though a strong gust of wind would blow it over. Against it lay an old wooden ladder with most of its rungs missing. A magpie was perched on top of the ladder, cawing rudely at me. I could see that the back fence was high and pale green colour bond, a brand of modular steel fence that I assumed was inspired by the Aussie corrugated iron industry. That was a plus. I was looking forward to getting a dog once I'd settled in. First, though, I had to get my cockatoo from my ex-husband. Andrew had refused to let me take our shared sulphur-crested cockatoo, Max. I knew Andrew would take good care of Max, but I knew equally well that he was keeping him just to spite me. I had raised Max from a baby bird after he had fallen out of his nest and broken his wing. Max could speak over two hundred words, and I was careful only to say polite words around him. I wasn't so sure what words he would now be hearing with Andrew. As I made my way to the front door, I noted the remains of a garden. The rose stems were bare with winter on the way, so I couldn't tell if they were alive or dead. Even the native bottle brush shrubs didn't look well. What on earth had I got myself into? The cottage was a dirty, faded grey, almost white, with broken white shutters on either side of the windows to my right. The window to my left was equally large, but had no shutters. I walked down the short pathway, opened the screen door, and turned the lock in the wooden door. As the door creaked open, I looked at the living room in front of me. The first impression, to my great relief, was one of cleanliness. The pale grey walls looked freshly painted and contrasted nicely with the white gloss trim of the doors and windows. I had rented the cottage furnished, so the next thing to catch my eye was the decidedly weird furniture. It looked like reproduction antique French furniture, complete with gilt edging, and there were throws over the top, along with mismatched cushions. Thankfully, the furniture was sparse, unlike in the boarding house. I figured a few more throws would disguise the worst of it. I walked in and adjusted the throw over the ornate cherry-pink velvet chair, making sure I also covered up the golden painted wood. There was an old leather sofa, and when I lifted up the drab beige throw and the old yellowing cushions over it, I saw long tears in the upholstery. Oh well, I'd just get a brighter throw and some nicer cushions, and no one would ever know the difference. I was pleased to see that the kitchen was a good size for such a small cottage, and had been recently renovated. The tiles were nice, bright, and white, and the bench tops appeared to be made of bamboo. Everything else in the kitchen was white. I was also pleased to see that the refrigerator was running. Cressida had assured me that it would be turned on for me before I arrived, but as she seemed a little odd, I had thought that perhaps she would forget. Clearly, she hadn't, as the refrigerator was humming along nicely and was cold inside. I shivered and thought that the weather was probably colder in the house than it was inside the refrigerator, so I crossed the room to open the door to the wood fire. It was nicely cleaned out inside, and wood was included in my rent, but I had forgotten to buy fire starter cubes. I was too tired and stressed to go outside and gather kindling, at least someone had stacked a wicker basket full of firewood next to the fire. I looked in the cupboard under the kitchen sink, and to my relief, someone had left a box of matches in there, as well as a bottle of kerosene. I selected the smallest pieces of wood and placed them at angles in the fireplace, then poured some kerosene over the top. I stood back at quite a distance and flicked in a lighted match. Boom! An instant roaring fire. I knew it was a dangerous way to light it, and I wouldn't do it again, maybe, but I had been warned just how cold the nights are up in the mountains. I would be sure to buy fire starter cubes and gather kindling the following day. Thank goodness the chimney had been cleaned and there were no possums living in it. After a brief moment of apparent indecision, the smoke went up the chimney and not into the room. I had no idea how to shut the flue, 
so let the fire do its own thing. I looked in the bathroom, which was tiny but adequate. Two green frogs sat on the windowsill, eyeing me off. I shuddered and shut the door. I had been told stories of frogs leaping out every time a toilet was flushed in the country, but I had taken it to be a joke. Now I wasn't so sure. No sooner had I sat down on the old but comfortable sofa than there was a knock on the door. What now? I walked to the door and flung it open to see two men standing there. Hello, Sybil Potts. Before I could answer, the man who had spoken continued. Good afternoon, I am Detective Anders, and this is Detective Johnston. The other man nodded to me. I assume the attending officers told you we would want to speak with you tonight. I figured the attending officers must be Sergeant Wesley and the constable. Yes, I said. May we come in? I showed them into the tiny living room where Detective Anders sat opposite me while Detective Johnston stood as close as he could to the fire, his back to it. Now, give me your version of events, Anders said, flipping open a notebook. I frowned. My version of events? That made it sound like I was a suspect. Nevertheless, I recounted the whole afternoon's events to Anders, while yawning every few moments. He questioned me over and over again as to whether I knew the victim, which irritated me no end. After telling me that the government contractors would take the exhibit, which I supposed must mean the body, after the crime scene exhibitors were finished with it, and explaining that they had to maintain the continuity of the exhibit, whatever that really meant, they finally left. I put another log on the fire and poked it with the provided poker until it was nicely aflame. I sank back into the sofa, shook my head, and stared at the burning embers for so long that I nearly fell asleep. My first day in town, and what a day it had been. Surely it couldn't get any worse. Chapter 5 The morning light was bright and cheerful as it streamed through the bedroom window. It made yesterday's events seem as if they were a bad dream. What's more, I had slept soundly, apart from being awoken once or twice by possums scrambling across the roof. At least, I hoped the noise was possums, as it had sounded like someone walking. I tried to push the unpleasant memories from my mind. I was declaring today to be the official first day of my new life. I wasn't having my first day tainted by dead bodies, giant possums, strange people, allegedly talking cats, and rude police officers. I swung my feet up and over the edge of the bed and jumped up to greet the day. I rummaged through the groceries for the microwaved rolled oats and the coffee. It was easy to get used to bad food when living on a strict budget. I was looking forward to some real food. A week of noodles, Vegemite toast, and fast food had me craving some real cooking. I fumbled through the cottage, banging my leg on a desk while navigating the unfamiliar surroundings. My surroundings, I thought with pleasure. The fact that the cottage had come furnished was a good feeling, bruised shins and all. No more crashing on a friend's couch or in a cheap motel. While it would likely be some time before the cottage truly felt like home, already it felt like a sanctuary to me. It was a good start, especially when I had given up everything I could sell to buy the mobile grooming van. The coffee pot sputtered and grumbled as I shuffled outside to get the rest of my bags. To my surprise, I found a rolled newspaper right at the doorway. I didn't recall the paper being part of the rent. A bright yellow post-it note caught my eye. Thought you would like to catch up on the local news. Your card for today is the Two of Swords. Kind regards, Mr. Buttons. I bit my lip. It was nice of Mr. Buttons to draw a tarot card for me, but I hoped he wasn't going to keep telling me what my cards were. I'd really rather not know what the future held. The Two of Swords. I thought hard. I didn't know a lot about tarot cards, but I knew a little. The card showed a woman blindfolded, a woman who didn't know the truth of what was in front of her. It had other meanings too, but that one sounded right. It was also nice of Mr. Buttons to give me a paper. 
but I wasn't especially keen on my neighbours leaving favours on my doorstep while I was sleeping. Still, I figured it was better than him waking me up at whatever hour he had decided to walk over. And of course, the community of a boarding house was very different to what I was used to. I was in the country now, not the city where one could live near someone for years and never once speak. I would need to remember to thank him later. I tucked the paper under my arm as I went to the van to collect my bags. On the one hand, I was a bit sad to see my whole world condensed into a few bags, but the optimist in me thought that it was nice to know that I wouldn't be spending the whole day unpacking. Besides, a new life would be easier without a van full of horrid old memories. By the time I got my things inside, the coffee pot was full and growling as if in discontent at being put to work. I unpacked my coffee mug and sugar packets from the tub and prepared to have a nice breakfast. With a packet of instant oatmeal in hand, I inspected the microwave. It looked as though it had only barely survived the 1980s. The dials and buttons were decidedly vintage. I poured the oatmeal into half a cup of water and put it inside the microwave, then pressed the buttons for 50 seconds. I wondered if I needed to leave the room, as it looked like it might explode. Thankfully, the microwave still worked fine, even if I had to send the oatmeal through twice, and one side came out kind of lumpy. It would do, though. I usually ate cornflakes for breakfast, but today I felt like a change. I unrolled the newspaper as I settled in to relax over my first breakfast in my new home. I tensed as I saw pictures and headlines of the previous day on the front page. The memory of the body flashed back in all its awful detail, the way the shadows fell, the way the sergeant glared at me when I spoke. I closed my eyes, took a steady breath and tried to calm my breathing. In through the nose. Hold. Out through the mouth. I slammed the newspaper shut and opened my eyes. There was no point in processing the events of yesterday, no point in mulling over each and every detail. I opened the newspaper to the third page and glanced over the minor headlines. Proposals for roadwork, a community fundraiser, someone annoyed that someone had stolen their garden gnome. I had to smile at how small town this place was compared to the chaos of the city I had left behind. I bit my lip and turned to the help wanted section. Ideally, I wanted my business to pay my bills. Realistically, I could not rely on my grooming service to pay the rent until I had built up a steady client base. I had money I could live on for some months, but if the town could not support a grooming business, I would need to find part-time work. Of course, none of this would matter once I got the property settlement, but my ex-husband was doing everything he could to delay it. The help wanted section had nothing suitable anyway. The jobs were all for station hands or stockmen and stated must have owned dogs or able to operate harvesters. I shrugged. I considered myself lucky to have a sum to cover rent, utilities and modest groceries for some time. It was a relief to have an emergency fund, no matter how small. I swallowed some lumpy oatmeal and pulled out my battered notebook, with its duct-taped cover. The notebook was filled cover to cover with notes, post-its, lists, and dreams for the grooming van. I ran my finger wistfully over a photo of my cockatoo, Max, that I had taped to the cover. Max was a huge white bird with, as the name Sulphur Crested suggested, a big yellow crest. He always had the cutest expression on his face, if I'd had a bad day or got caught up in a sad movie, he was right there waiting for me to tell him all about it with big dark eyes and his head turned to the side. I blinked back the tears, trying not to let any fall. The divorce had been long and cruel. I had put that man through college, sometimes working two jobs and double shifts. His wealthy parents had said he needed to work through college to pay his own way so he could gain moral fortitude. What a joke. He had told me he was unable to cope with both studying and working, so I had gone to work to support both of us. I had foregone many nice things for myself. I had even missed a family reunion when he said I had to choose between that 
and supporting him through his exams in his last semester. Andrew had rewarded my sacrifices by cheating on me. When I had caught him, overhearing him on the phone with a woman on a day when I had come home early, he had tried to throw the blame onto me for always being away at work. In a romantic haze, I had intended to sign the prenup he had presented me with prior to us getting married. But luckily, as it turned out, I'd had a most disturbing vision of me being penniless, so I had gone to a lawyer and made sure that the prenup was fair. Andrew had been furious about it at the time, so much so that I had even considered not marrying him. Now, any request I made, he made it a point to block, no matter how unimportant it was to him. He even kept the birthday gifts he had given me. His lawyer said I legally had to give my engagement ring back to him. Andrew, because of his wealthy family, wanted to make sure I didn't get a cent of the family fortune. I was most upset that he had not allowed me to take Max. We were both fond of him, but Andrew knew that keeping Max would rip out a piece of my soul. He wanted to punish me for leaving him. Fortunately, not everything had gone Andrew's way. I was awarded a modest monetary sum to take care of my needs, and he was ordered to send me my personal items, such as my photo albums. I wished I had taken them earlier, but everything is clearer in hindsight. There was so much in those photo albums, and I had no way to protect them while they were in his hands. Chapter 6 I was at a loose end, so decided to go to the main house. After all, Cressida had invited me to have a cup of tea, although she had not specified a time. I hesitated in front of the boarding house, looking at the enormous, dark, and somewhat creepy mansion towering above me. The peeling paint showed signs of years of neglect. The bleak, sparsely grassed paddocks spreading out to the horizon and the looming dark clouds in the sky caused me to shiver to my core. There were several deciduous trees at the front of the house, and their leafless frames danced wildly in the wind. I jumped as an open window swung in the wind and banged against the peeling wood. One shutter bore large holes that left a few jagged pieces dangling on the inside. There were no other homes around, just trees and some curious Hereford cows grazing on the neighbouring land. On this visit, the boarding house seemed untamed, unwelcoming, and utterly unsightly. It made my skin crawl. I stepped from the overgrown browning grass onto the creaky steps. I knocked on the boarding house's main door and then stepped back. I expected someone to open the door and welcome me in, but no one came to the door. I figured that no one had heard me knock, and so I knocked again, harder this time. Again, no one came to the door. Frowning, I turned the doorknob and stepped in. I walked down the corridor and tried my best to avert my eyes from the police tape cordoning off the crime scene, but couldn't help seeing it. The sheer bright yellowness of the tape distracted me. I saw no police this time, but heard a humming sound coming from the room, so I walked over to the door and looked in. To my surprise, I saw a vacuum cleaner and Mr. Buttons polishing the coffee table. Mr. Buttons! Mr. Buttons looked up. His eyes barely flickered with recognition as he looked down again to polish the coffee table. Hello, Sybil. Welcome again, he muttered, his crisp English accent cutting throughout the room. I was aghast. Mr. Buttons, you shouldn't be cleaning up a crime scene. The police might still need to collect evidence. What do you think the tape is for? I pointed at the police tape that was barring my entrance to the crime scene. But Mr. Buttons continued to polish the coffee table wordlessly. I tried to catch his eye as he turned around to polish a different section of the coffee table. Mr. Buttons! The voice came from behind me. I swung around to see Alison, the maid. Mr. Buttons, what do you think you're doing? She said, her voice bordering on angry. To my relief, Mr. Buttons put the rag away and came to meet us. He climbed under the tape. I'm cleaning the place, he said. It's so messy and awful, I couldn't stand it. I just had to do something about it. 
My jaw fell open. At the same time, the cogs in my mind turned furiously, trying to work out whether Mr. Buttons could possibly be the murderer. I was about to speak, but Allison beat me to it. Mr. Buttons, the police clearly aren't done with the crime scene. Can't you see it's still cordoned off by the tape? What will they think of you cleaning up in here? Mr. Buttons shrugged, although his face did turn pale. I'm sorry, but I had to clean up. Lord Farrington has been shedding cat hair all over the rug, and like I said, I couldn't stand it. Anyway, the police will have already taken all the evidence by now. The maid rolled her eyes and then shrugged. Come on, I'll make you a nice cup of tea. I followed them both down the dark corridor, assuming I was included in the invitation. I again noticed the musty old scent that was emanating from the walls. We walked into the kitchen. It was no better than the rest of the house, except that it was sparkling clean. It was smaller than I expected. I guessed it had been updated in the 1950s. The floors were a horrible mixture of beige and mustard tiles. The high ceiling was a weird shade of orange, as were the kitchen cupboards. There was a particularly hideous orange floral blind over the only window. Shelving in dark wood lined the rest of the walls on that side. Opposite the wall of built-in cupboards was a cast-iron combustion stove, clearly very old and no longer in use. It was an unusual shade of aqua, with the word metas stamped across the door for the wood and the word Canberra stamped across the oven door. The top of it was speckled lime green enamel. It sat heavily in an old red brick structure that had seen better days, and the backsplash was a revolting shade of mustard. In the middle of the kitchen was an old iron and formica table with a few chairs, and that was where Mr. Button sat. I followed his lead. Alison busied herself making a pot of tea, she deposited cups on the table and poured tea into them and was on her way back to the bench with the teapot when she suddenly stopped and exclaimed, The bowl's missing. I wondered what the problem was. Mr. Buttons appeared equally upset. Oh no, are you sure? Alison pointed to the table. It was there, in a plastic bag. I looked at Mr. Buttons. Could someone please tell me what you're talking about? Mr. Buttons fidgeted. This morning, Alison and I went into the library, and we found a bowl half filled with cereal in there. The library is rarely used, and I said that Tim Higgins might have been in there. As you said it was cyanide, Alison and I thought we should put the bowl in a plastic bag to keep it safe, just in case Tim was eating from it before he died. It had some of that diet cereal he used to eat in it. Alison said she'd called the police to collect it. We left it here in the kitchen, Alison said. Now it's gone. She glared at Mr. Buttons and then gasped, raising her hand to her face. The dishwasher. She hurried to the dishwasher and opened it. After the steam cleared, we could see a lone cereal bowl. Alison looked up at Mr. Buttons. Mr. Buttons... Why did you put the bowl in the dishwasher? Mr. Button shook his head. It wasn't me. Alison put her hands on her hips. Well, someone took that bowl out of the plastic bag and put it in the dishwasher. What's more, it's the only item in the dishwasher, so it's not as if someone did it by accident. I watched as the man's jaw ticked, his fists clenching across the table. He took up his cup of tea and sipped it slowly, but then set it back down again so that he could speak. I have obsessive compulsive disorder when it comes to cleanliness and neatness and the like. I can't control it. If it's dirty, I must clean it, he said. Yet I can assure you I did not touch that cereal bowl. No one had a chance to speak further as Cressida burst into the room with Sergeant Wesley right behind her. Blake is here for the bowl, she announced, stating the obvious. Mr. Buttons and I exchanged glances. I noticed that Allison looked decidedly uncomfortable. The sergeant nodded to us. Now, where's that bowl? For a moment, no one spoke, and then Mr. Buttons said, 
After Alison called you about the cereal bowl, I decided to vacuum, and then Sybil came, and Alison made us a cup of tea. Blake shifted from one foot to another. I could see he was impatient, but he waited for Mr. Buttons to continue. Then, Mr. Buttons said, when the three of us came into the kitchen, Alison noticed that the dishwasher was on. She opened it, and the cereal bowl was in there. Blake looked at us. Did any of you do it? We shook our heads. Mr. Buttons stood up. Blake, you know I have obsessive compulsive disorder, and I can't control it. I admit that I vacuumed the crime scene. Blake interrupted him. You vacuumed the crime scene? Mr. Buttons folded his arms across his chest. I had to clean up the mess. It was horrible. Once the police have their evidence ready, you'll see that I'm clearly not the perpetrator of the crime. I simply had to clean it, he repeated. Blake's face darkened. We've finished with the crime scene anyway. Just as well for you, Mr. Buttons. Now tell me, who had access to this room after Allison called me, apart from the three of you and Miss Upthorpe? He looked directly at me. For some reason, his unwavering gaze made me feel guilty. I didn't have access to it, I said. I didn't go anywhere near the kitchen. Blake gave me a weary look. Who met you at the door? I frowned. Well, no one. I knocked for a while, and when no one came, I walked inside and found Mr. Buttons. So you could have gone straight to the kitchen first. I narrowed my eyes. I hadn't thought of it like that. Well, yes, I suppose, but I didn't, I ended lamely. Blake turned back to Mr. Buttons. Why did you go into the library? Cressida interrupted him. Lord Farrington told me that I'd left my favourite reading glasses in there, so I asked Mr. Buttons if he'd go fetch them for me. Mr. Buttons nodded vigorously. And as I was going in there, Alison saw me and came with me. Blake's face was growing redder. Lord Farrington? You mean the cat, right? He shook his head, and before anyone could respond, he added, Who else had access to the kitchen? Only Nora, the cleaning lady, Cressida said. And where is Nora now? Cressida walked over to the table and sat down. Cleaning upstairs somewhere. Blake rubbed his forehead. All right, would someone please go get her? I'll go, Alison hurried out of the room. An uncomfortable silence hung in the room. After a while, Cressida got up and made herself a cup of tea. I fidgeted nervously, while Blake just stood there, his arms still crossed. I looked at Mr. Buttons as he sipped his tea, not making eye contact with anyone. Was he telling the truth, or was he trying to cover something up? It seemed like an age before Alison returned with Nora, who was clearly flustered. She was clutching a spray bottle of disinfectant to her chest. The sergeant pointed to a chair. Sit down, please, Nora. Nora looked around, I assume for a place to deposit the bottle. Cressida, visibly annoyed with her, stood up and took the bottle from her. Nora sat down and then looked at each of us in turn. Nora, where have you been for the last hour? Nora looked at the cop. Upstairs? cleaning. Blake wrote that in his notebook. When he had finished, he looked up at her. For the whole hour? You didn't come downstairs at all? Yes. I mean, no. Nora shook her head. I mean, I've been cleaning upstairs for the whole hour, and I didn't come downstairs. Not once in that time. Nora shook her head again and wrung her hands. Blake wrote something else in his notebook. And you didn't see anyone the whole time? No, Nora said. Nora and I looked at each other. I'd had no idea that Nora even existed or was working at the boarding house, and we as yet hadn't been introduced. Still, I suppose now wasn't the time for social niceties. Blake looked around at all of us. And no one admits to putting that bowl in the dishwasher. We all shook our heads. Blake frowned. The detectives will be back to interview all of you. His tone was solemn. Why? I asked. Does that mean it was murder? Tim Higgins, I mean. Blake looked at me for a moment before answering. Yes. 
Everyone gasped. All the results aren't back yet, he continued, but they found evidence of cyanide poisoning in the trachea and bronchi, along with other signs. The pathologist has sent samples to the toxicologist to confirm cyanide, but at this stage it's pretty clear it was murder by cyanide. What's more, his last meal was diet cereal. There was a collective gasp. I looked around at each person in turn. Someone sitting here was surely the murderer. Cressida? Mr. Buttons? Allison? Nora? Someone had put that cereal bowl in the dishwasher to destroy the evidence. The only thing I knew for sure was that Mr. Buttons and Allison couldn't have been in on it together, as they had found the bowl together and alerted the police. That left four murder suspects, and all of them my close neighbours. Chapter 7 I jumped when someone knocked on the door. Surely the detectives hadn't come back. They had come to my cottage and given me the third degree the previous day after the incident with the bowl. Surely they didn't think I was a suspect. After all, I was the one who had mentioned cyanide. Hello? Anybody there? State your name, I called out. I figured it wouldn't be a good idea to fling open the door and find a murderer on my doorstep. Not that I'd know the murderer if I saw him or her, I realised. Yes, it's Alison, a female voice said through the door. I opened the door and gave her my warmest smile to make up for acting weirdly. Hi, Alison. I'm glad to see you. I motioned for her to come in. She smiled and shook her head. No, thanks. I just came to invite you to lunch. Today? I tried to figure out the time. I'd fallen asleep on the sofa after a restless night of tossing and turning. Alison nodded. Yes, now. I've made some preparations already. The tenants are out and Cressida's away for the day. I smiled. I'd love to come over for lunch. Thanks. I closed the door behind me and followed Alison down the worn pathway to the large boarding house, down the creepy, dismal corridor and into the dated kitchen. I sat and watched in the kitchen like an obedient child while Alison chopped up the vegetables and stirred some broth in a pot. As Alison was cooking, I squirmed in my seat, suddenly nervous. I was aware of the fact that I was sitting in the very boarding house where the murder was committed. Who could the murderer be? I had no clue, and I hoped the police were doing better. I wondered if Alison suspected Mr. Buttons though could hardly ask. There we go, Alison said, depositing the food on the table. She laid out a soup bowl and plate with a crusty fresh bread roll. It was a welcome change from the ghastly microwave dinners I usually made for myself. I raised a spoon of soup to my mouth and blew on it, pretending I was doing so to cool it down, but I sniffed it as I inhaled before blowing. After all, Alison could well be the murderer. There was no smell of bitter almonds, so I gingerly placed the spoon in my mouth. To my relief, Alison ate some soup. She had ladled both her soup and mine from the same pot. Thanks, Alison. This is good. She shrugged as if it wasn't a big deal. There was no conversation for a while, but just as I finished my soup, Alison spoke. You're not married? I hesitated for a moment and then answered, No, I'm not. I'm divorced. My husband cheated on me, so I left him. I decided to come here for a new start. I laid down my spoon, the topic of my ex-husband leaving a bitter taste that lingered in my mouth. Alison folded her hands and her eyes narrowed. I got rid of my man for the same reason. She chuckled, but did not look at all amused. I was curious about Alison's story, but I could see from the stony lines on her face that she didn't want to push the topic further. What do you think of the sergeant? I was taken aback by Alison's question. Um, he's all right, I suppose. He'd be better if he didn't see me as a suspect. Alison laughed. I'm sure he doesn't. His last girlfriend. She stopped and rolled her eyes. 
Well, I haven't been in town for long, but Cressida said she was attractive, but there was nothing in her head. She was always going on about vibrations and things like that. You know, to cure illnesses. She was a new age hippie type. Who knows what she was talking about? Do you think you'll ever get married again? I shrugged. Dunno. It's way too early to think about such things. It would be nice to have someone to depend on, that sort of thing. A wave of sadness overwhelmed me, and I bit back the tears. I had thought that Andrew was the man I would always be with, that he was the one. Now he was gone, and I was in a strange town all by myself. Alison nodded her agreement. So you're going to do pet grooming? Yes, I bought a mobile pet grooming van. I've always loved animals, and I've always wanted my own business, and now I have both. It's a bit daunting, though. I don't know if I'll be able to make enough out of it to live on. Did you leave him as soon as he cheated on you? Alison asked. I was surprised by the rapid change of subject and didn't reply for a while, pushing the bread roll around my plate. I had only just met Alison and barely knew anything about her, and what's more, I had only opened up to my family about my divorce. I had written down the feelings, the hurt, and the anger and everything pertaining to it in my journal. I had no desire to open up to Alison, but I had to say something. Yes, what about you? Alison frowned and bit her bottom lip. It had been going on for some time, but it took me a while to come to my senses and sort it all out. I swallowed a bite of the bread roll and murmured my sympathy. And you never remarried? Alison looked shocked. Oh, it was fairly recent. I'm sorry. I thought that Alison and I might become friends. After all, we'd shared an experience. Mine had cheated on me for some time before I found out. Alison nodded. That was probably the case with me, too. You know, I don't even know how he found women out where he was working in the mining industry. Alison looked interested. Where was he working? Out on an oil rig? Not many women work offshore. I frowned. No, but not many women work where he works either. But he managed to find them, that's for sure. He's a chemical engineer, working for one of the companies that makes sodium cyanide. Alison gasped. I shot her a sharp look, and she said, People make cyanide? Like the cyanide that killed Tim Higgins? I nodded. Sure, for the mining industry, you know, to separate gold and silver from iron ore, that kind of thing. I was always stuck in Sydney, and Andrew was always working away from home. I was surprised that no tears had sprung to my eyes while I recounted my sorry tale. Alison reached over the table and squeezed my hand. I'm sorry, that's awful. I can relate, though. My ex was the same. Your last name, Potts, is that your husband's name? I meant to give a rude, short laugh, but it came out more like a grunt. No, his name is Rankin, Andrew Rankin. Potts is my maiden name. I changed it back to that when I found out that Andrew had several affairs. I wanted nothing to do with that name. I looked at Alison, but her face was frozen. Alison, are you okay? She tossed her head. That's awful, Sybil. I'm so sorry to hear that. Did you say he had several affairs? I nodded. Yes, he admitted to it. Well, gloated, more like it. Men have needs, Alison snapped and sometimes they neglect to remember that those needs should be satisfied by just one woman and not by some. Alison's voice trailed away and she clutched at her throat. I wondered if her divorce was recent. It appeared as if that were the case, given her reaction. I wanted to comfort Alison, but didn't know how. At that, the conversation died away, and there seemed to be no point in furthering it. I stood up to carry my dirty plates to the sink, but Alison stopped me. The dishwasher takes care of everything. Don't worry about the dishes. Let me show you to the door, Alison said. 
I protested, but left the plates on the table as Alison led me out of the boarding house. I walked back to the cottage with an overwhelming sense of tiredness. I just wanted a quiet life with no drama or intrigue. Was that too much to ask? Chapter 8 I woke up to the sound of Don't Stop Believing blaring from my bedside radio. It was earlier, earlier than I normally wake up. I had a trip to make, but otherwise today could be spent however I pleased. I had no clients lined up for the day, and I wanted to spend time figuring out how to get more business. I got up and ran through my routine, having a shower, doing my hair and makeup, getting dressed, making a morning coffee, and eating a bowl of cereal. This morning, the coffee and cereal both tasted different. I was in the habit of having both every morning, but today something was wrong. Maybe the milk in the cereal was bad, maybe it was something else, but I drank the coffee and ate the cereal anyway. One doesn't break a caffeine and cereal addiction for the simple issue of terrible flavour. I was in a rush to get on the road. I was going to pick up a Simpson Superjet stand dryer for my dog grooming business. The older dryer that had come with the van had been playing up, and I didn't want to risk it breaking down in the midst of a job. A town as small as Little Tatterford didn't stock this kind of specialty product, so I had to make the drive over the nearby mountain to the next town over. It was only an hour or so, but it wasn't a trip I could make if I had clients to tend to. Luckily, today was open. Aside from my bad coffee, the day was looking up. The sun was shining, and the forecast said the nice weather was here to stay. I jumped in my van early, so I could get home early and relax for the afternoon. It started on the first go, something I wished would happen more often, and I was off for the morning. I didn't mind the trip, but it wasn't particularly exciting. The mountain, which comprised the majority of travel time, was full of twists and turns, which at least kept me alert, but the scenery was nothing to write home about. There were about twenty minutes of straight road between Little Tatterford and the base of the mountain, which had the exact opposite problem. From there the road was straight and exceptionally boring, but the countryside was beautiful. There were rolling hills in the distance, with farmland in the foreground, with sheep, horses and cattle mulling about lazily. I wondered what it would be like to spend the day as such an animal, just wandering aimlessly about, doing nothing but eating food and sleeping. It dawned on me that recently my life hadn't been so different, for better or worse. I was already feeling quite groggy before I reached the base of the mountain. It had only been fifteen minutes, I'd made good time, but I was feeling so tired that it were as if I had made the entire trip already. Maybe a second coffee would have helped. Either way, there wasn't anywhere safe to pull over for the next several minutes. Today was a day for being lazy, like the cows, not for being sensible. As ridiculous as it was, this was the sentiment that ran through my mind as I drove along. I felt my thoughts degrade into this sort of thinking. Normally my driving time was spent in quiet reflection, but on this trip something was off. I was thinking silly, irrelevant thoughts. I noticed the birds flitting around, diving in front of the car, and wondered what it must be like to sing all day. I noticed a lizard on the road and thought about his or her family. My eyelids closed on a straight stretch of road, opening just before a sharp turn. I slammed on the brakes, too late, crashing through the barricade and barreling off the side of a cliff. The last thing I saw was the ground rushing up to meet me. Don't Stop Believing was blaring from my bedside radio. My eyesight was still blurry, but I knew I was at home. Had that all been a vision? I turned off the radio and tried to stop shaking. The vision, as usual, had been so real that I'd thought it was actually happening. I had a shower, got dressed, and began to make a pot of coffee, all the time thinking about my vision. I had been so tired... But why? It was an unnatural tiredness, nothing at all like just being sleepy. 
I made the coffee and poured milk into a bowl of cereal, but when I remembered from my vision that both had tasted funny, I decided to forego the coffee and cereal and just take the drive, albeit more carefully than normal. I drove along, remembering the countryside in detail. I saw the same horses, cows and sheep as I did last time. In my vision, I had already been feeling tired by the time I'd reached the base of the mountain. This time, I felt fine, as alert as ever. The only difference this time had been my breakfast, but coffee and cereal couldn't do that, unless, of course, they had been tampered with. Poisoned, perhaps. More than being afraid, I felt an intense surge of frustration. Somebody had tried to kill or at least seriously injure me, and I had no way to prove it. But who could have done it? They must have wanted this to look like an accident. I turned the previously deadly corner of the mountain without too much thought to my vision. My mind was elsewhere now, wondering who could have done it. There was no way to narrow it down to a single suspect. Anybody could have broken in, and there was a master key kept in the main house. If somebody had access to it, they could have easily broken in and poisoned me. Of course, anybody could have broken in without it, or just stolen the key itself. I spent the rest of the uneventful trip pondering these possibilities. I collected and paid for the dryer without incident and made my way home. As I pulled into my driveway, I saw Blake Wesley pounding on my front door. I pulled up and called to him. Sybil, he yelled, running towards me. Are you okay? What's happened? I didn't know what to say. How could he have known something was wrong? Why was he here? I froze to the spot, my mind whirring. Allison found your note in the mail and called us immediately. You need to tell me what's wrong. What note? I asked though I was beginning to have a pretty good idea where this was going. You mean you didn't write it? Blake frowned. Sybil, we found a suicide note. It said that you'd been depressed since your divorce and, well, that you were going to kill yourself. I should have been upset or frightened, yet all I could think was that this was evidence, key evidence. Someone had tried to set up this attempt on my life to look like a suicide, and the note itself was a clue. Perhaps the police would even be able to identify who wrote it from the handwriting. Blake, I didn't write that note. I think somebody poisoned my coffee or cereal, maybe both, this morning, and tried to make it look like a suicide. Where is that note now? Blake looked shocked. It's in the main house. We'll go and collect it now. If somebody really did intend you harm, that note's going to be evidence. We walked to the main house without saying a word to each other. Blake seemed to be worried about me, but my mind was racing. There wasn't enough evidence here to figure out who could have done this. After all, anyone could have written a note and left it in the mailbox. But the note itself could give away the identity of the attempted murderer, who was almost definitely the same person that killed Tim Higgins. When we arrived, Mr. Buttons was standing at the reception desk, Hello, Mr. Buttons, Blake said. Have you seen Alison? She was holding a note for me. Oh, yes, Mr. Buttons replied. She gave it to me a few minutes ago and asked me to hold it. But I, uh, his voice trailed away. I seem to have misplaced it. You what? Blake asked, clenching his fists. You misplaced it? That note was key evidence in a case. I'm terribly sorry, Sergeant Wesley, but I've been forgetful lately. I'm sure it will turn up somewhere around here. After all, I haven't left the room since Alison gave it to me and told me to wait. I have no idea where it could have gone. Blake sighed deeply and turned back to the door. Come with me, Sybil. I just have to ask you a few questions. We went back to my cottage and sat in the dining room. I'd offer you a coffee or a bowl of cereal, but, well, I was half joking, but Blake didn't see the humour. Listen, Sybil, I need you to tell me exactly what happened. How do you know your food was poisoned? Did you drink any coffee or eat any cereal? Are you okay? I'm fine, Blake, really. Thank you, but I'm okay. I didn't eat any of it. 
then how do you know it was poisoned? He gave me a stern look, and suddenly I felt much less at ease. How was Blake going to react when I told him about the vision? It made matters worse that his ex-girlfriend had been some sort of new age hippie type, to quote Allison, so he wasn't going to take kindly to the fact that I have visions. Not that I was thinking of him as potential boyfriend material, of course. I let out a long sigh. Look, Blake, I know this will be difficult to believe, but I had a vision. I had a vision that I drank the coffee and ate the cereal, and then my car went over the cliff. I think it must have been laced with sleeping pills or some sort of drug with a similar effect. Blake stared at me, clearly not believing a word of it. I could see that he was sceptical. I supposed good police officers have to be. But it seemed to me that he was not even entertaining the possibility that I'd had an honest-to-goodness premonition. You're kidding, right? You had a vision that you had deadly coffee and cereal, and then you died in a crash. That's not any kind of evidence, Sybil. That's nothing. He sighed again and leant back in his chair, shaking his head. But what about the suicide note? I said, doing my best to keep calm, despite the fact that I was angry. How could he not believe someone was trying to kill me? You saw the note yourself, and you know I didn't write it. Why would somebody write something like that if they didn't want me dead? Blake shook his head again. I'm not saying there's nothing here. I saw the note, and it's suspicious beyond a doubt. I also think it's quite likely that you're in serious trouble. However, you have to understand why I can't accept a poison coffee and cereal vision as evidence of any kind. Blake had eased up a little now, and I sensed a little empathy in him. Is there anything you can do for me? I asked. Well, we'll have the coffee and cereal analysed for you. Unfortunately, we'll have to take all of it, of course. He smirked just a little. Oh no, I'd rather just die than have you take away all my coffee and cereal. He failed to see the funny side. I'll cut you a deal. You let me take all this coffee and cereal and have it analysed, and I'll buy you a cup of coffee, maybe even a bowl of cereal tomorrow morning. He said this so sincerely that I wasn't even sure if he was flirting. While I wasn't especially interested in Blake, I'd had enough of men to last me a lifetime thanks to my ex-husband. I was certainly interested in coffee. It's a date. Chapter 9 Blake had taken me to a quaint, a word which I use here to mean unattractive, little cafe in the middle of town. Initially, I wasn't impressed. The exterior was run down and ancient, some would call it rustic, but again, I think unattractive is a perfectly adequate word for it. I was certainly surprised at the interior, which boasted a more modern decor. A waitress came over to take our orders, and she had a wide smile. In fact, it seemed to me that she was trying not to chuckle. Well, hello, Blake, she said. Who's your friend? She winked at me. I wanted to say I'm not his friend, but couldn't so I just sat there. I noted that Blake flushed red. This is Sybil Potts, one of Cressida's new boarders, he said. She's renting the cottage. I had the urge to give the waitress my shoe size as well. Was there no privacy in this town? The waitress smiled at me. Oh, yes, you have that mobile dog grooming service, don't you? I returned her smile. Yes, but I groom cats as well. I do a good powder pack on a Persian show cat, and I also clip all types of long hair pet cats. The waitress promptly lost interest. So, what are you having? I ordered a latte and a cheese croissant, and Blake ordered a long black and French toast with maple syrup and bacon. I felt like I had gone to hot beverage heaven. It was some of the best coffee I'd ever had, and the cheese croissant with its creamy bechamel sauce only added to the delectable meal. Good restaurants made food less appealing than this. Blake ordered me a second croissant, and I ate as if I were starving. It was all so good. No wonder the locals crowded this place. Blake and I got to chatting about different things, both of us awkwardly dancing around the subject of murder and suicide, 
as one does on these social occasions. Inevitably, the conversation turned to the sad fate of Tim Higgins, as well as the man himself. Blake explained to me, probably in more detail than he was allowed, that Tim Higgins had once been a shady antique dealer. While Higgins did not have a criminal record, he had been a person of interest to the police force for quite some time. He also had more than a few criminal acquaintances, which alone was enough to warrant suspicion. However, they had never been able to prove anything. Do you think his death was related to this somehow? I asked. It was a genuine question, but I was more concerned with Blake's answer. He was being open and honest today, and I was hoping to learn more about the case, as well as about Blake himself. We really don't know, he said with a shrug. Like I said, it's been hard to pin anything on him. His death could have been totally unrelated, and of course it still might have been of natural causes, regardless of what you believe. He looked at me quite sternly as he said this. I sighed. It must be hard trying to solve a case like this with such a small police force here. When did Tim Higgins arrive in town? I didn't think it was particularly relevant, but wanted to make sure we stayed on this topic. Actually, that's even more suspicious. Cressida Upthorpe appeared on a television show. Oh, I can't think of the name. It was something like Antiques Roadshow. With a particularly valuable antique, only two weeks before Tim Higgins arrived here as a permanent boarder. Like I said earlier, though, as far as we know, he's never actually done anything. I bit my lip. So I don't quite understand why you and the other police are so suspicious of him. Blake looked at his coffee for a while before answering. It's mostly because of his acquaintances and how his antique dealings appeared on the books. There were some suspicious numbers and things didn't quite add up. It could have just been poor bookkeeping, but combined with the people he knew, it was enough to arouse some serious suspicion. I nodded. The kind of people he knew? Yes, mostly people who dealt with similar things, although they had criminal records. People who had been caught stealing antiques, melting down stolen gold jewellery, that kind of thing. Relatively speaking, it's nothing major such as homicide, but it's enough to land them some serious jail time. Do you think he actually did anything? I asked. At this point, I was sure that Tim Higgins had been up to some seriously shady behaviour, but I was hoping to get more out of Blake. Personally, yes, I do. I think he was just as crooked as his friends, only better at covering his tracks. Since the police couldn't pin anything on him, though, it's a moot point. Even more so now, I suppose. Blake narrowed his eyes. Sybil is an unusual name. I laughed. You think Sybil is unusual? My sister's name is Phyto. Don't ask, I added with a wave of my hand. You were named after a relative? I sighed, both at his abrupt change of subject away from the topic of murder and at the personal question. How on earth could I explain? Blake was staring at me fixedly, so I took a deep breath. It's a family tradition. Every firstborn daughter in my mother's family has been named Sybil, right back to ancient Greek times, or so they say. We were named after the priestess of Apollo who could foretell the future in visions. Oh, the Delphic Oracle. I shook my head. No, everyone thinks that, but the Sybil and the Delphic Oracle were two entirely separate people. I could have gone on, but Blake didn't appear at all interested in ancient history. He seemed more interested in the here and now. Are you trying to tell me that you really do have visions of the future? He asked the question somewhat half-heartedly, as if he wasn't expecting me to answer in the affirmative. I fidgeted nervously and looked around the cafe. Well, yes, I do, I said. And they come true, I added firmly. Well, at least if the person doesn't do something to stop them. Blake appeared to be confused. How do you mean? I thought you'd had a one-off premonition. I said that as a joke. I trembled. Now my secret was out, thanks to my own stupidity. Every firstborn daughter in my mother's family for hundreds of years was said to have had visions. That is why all firstborn daughters were given the first name Sybil. Through visions, I had been able to predict things from childhood. 
However, the visions rarely happened, and I could not call them up at will. Had I been able to do so, I would not now be at the end of a rather nasty divorce. I took a deep breath before answering, Well, in my premonitions, the future isn't set. I had a vision of me drinking coffee and eating cereal that had sleeping pills or whatever in it, and then falling asleep and driving over a cliff. Then I was able to avoid drinking the coffee and eating the cereal. You see? Yes, he said, but it was clear he didn't quite believe me. He took a long drink of his coffee and looked at his watch. I have to get back to the station, he said, looking at me sternly. Promise me you'll stay safe. I might not believe that you had a magical dream, Sybil, but I do believe you're in real danger. Just say the word and I'll organise to have an officer watch your place. I smiled at him. I would have thought you'd have an officer on watch anyway, given the circumstances. Well, I'd like to, but without a specific request, it's better to keep them on other tasks. This isn't the most exciting town in the world, but it does have its fair share of trouble. I don't like to waste manpower if I can help it. Blake narrowed his eyes, and I figured he considered that he had just been a little too honest. Look, I'm happy to provide an officer if you want one. Nothing's more important than the safety of the townsfolk here. It's fine, Blake, but thank you. To be honest, I don't think anyone would try to hurt me again so soon, especially if they know the police are involved. Blake shrugged, and it seemed as if he intended to say something else, but then decided against it. Well, it was good to see you, he said, standing up. I'll check on you later, okay? Just stay safe. He left with a wave. Chapter 10 I watched Blake leave and wondered if I should order a second coffee. I stood up to look around for the waitress and saw Mr. Buttons reading, or rather hiding behind, a newspaper at the booth just behind my seat. How long had he been sitting there? Had he heard everything Blake had said? Mr. Button saw me watching him and waved me over. Sit down, Sybil. We need to talk. I did as I was asked and sat opposite him. What about? Mr. Buttons leant forward. I heard Blake tell you all about Mr. Higgins. I was suspicious of that man right from the time he arrived. He was always looking too hard at the antiques and asking Cressida questions. The moon was always coming up when I did a tarot spread about him. Do you always do tarot spreads about everyone you know? I asked, picturing him sitting in the privacy of his room, finding out information about others from his cards. Have you done tarot spreads about me? I added. Mr. Buttons shook his head. No, I've only pulled a card about you, not a full spread. It's always the same one. Two of swords. There's something you're not seeing, Sybil, and you need to figure it out. I shuddered. But at that point the waitress walked over and I ordered coffee before turning my attention back to Mr. Buttons. You said Tim Higgins was always asking Cressida questions. What kind of questions? Mr. Buttons shrugged. He asked the sorts of questions that only someone who knew about antiques would ask. I did wonder if he was looking to steal something, and his body was found in the storage room, which is usually locked. That adds up as suspicious to me. Here, I brought these. He pulled two pairs of latex gloves from the pocket on the breast of his shirt and handed me a pair. I looked at him aghast. I knew he was OCD about cleanliness, but this was carrying it a bit too far. Before I could speak, he continued, Put those on. I have some evidence to hand you. I did as I was told, and Mr. Buttons pushed a folded piece of paper across the table at me. I opened it with my gloved hands, and there was my suicide note. Why didn't you give it to Blake just then? I didn't want him to know that I was listening into your conversation, Mr. Button said in a matter-of-fact tone. I'll go to the police station today and give it to him. I looked at the writing. To my surprise, it did, in fact, look very much like my handwriting. It's lucky you found it, I said, peering at it. Mr. Button snickered. I didn't lose it. I wanted to photograph it and show Cressida before I handed it over to the police. I was utterly shocked. But 
Why? Why would you do such a thing? I stammered. Well, to see if we recognized the writing, of course. Mr. Buttons looked at me as if I had taken leave of my senses. And did you? No, but we now have photographs, so we can keep comparing it to any handwriting samples we come across. I doubt the police will go to so much trouble. Mr. Buttons took a sip of his tea, set down his teacup, and leant forward. Sybil, someone murdered Tim Higgins, and now they want to do away with you, he whispered. According to the principles of logic, that means that they think you know something. I don't know anything, I said loudly, and Mr. Buttons waved at me to hush me, while the waitress arrived and set down another coffee in front of me. When she left, he again addressed me in the whispered tone. Obviously, the murderer thinks you do. Think, Sybil, think. Have you stumbled across anything, anything at all, that could give a clue as to the murderer's identity? I sat and sipped my coffee while I racked my brains. I came up blank. No, nothing at all, unless... Unless what? Mr. Buttons prompted. Well, unless it's the fact that I can smell cyanide. Mr. Buttons thought for a while. No, it can't be that. It must be something else. Did you see anything that made you suspicious, even slightly? I thought again before answering. No, nothing at all. Mr. Buttons frowned. It's all about memory, Sybil. I've noticed that memory can be misleading. Have you ever watched a movie and then later watched it again and certain parts weren't at all how you remembered them? As that is the case, I wonder then how accurate any memories are. Do you know, I read once that people think their memories hold an actual record of their past, just as if it was being replayed on a DVD. But the fact is that people remember only segments. The mind has a strong compulsion to weave those segments together into a running story. In some cases, people can have vivid and specific memories of events that never happened. Are you sure you can't remember anything, even little segments? I tried so hard to remember that my forehead hurt from frowning. No, I said after a long pause. Mr. Buttons appeared disappointed. Well, let's go and look through Tim Higgins' room. We might find something useful in there. Haven't the police already done that? Well, yes, he said, but they might have overlooked something. It won't hurt to look. I chewed the end of my thumb. Are we allowed to look? I don't think so, Mr. Button said, averting his eyes and taking another sip of tea. If we hurry, we can have a good look around before Alison returns from her afternoon off. I agreed. I figured I had nothing to lose. Perhaps there was a snippet of evidence in Tim Higgins' room, or perhaps Mr. Buttons himself was the murderer. He was certainly on my list of suspects, as was everyone I'd met in this town, apart from the police. I had a vested interest now. Someone had tried to kill me. The police didn't appear to be in a hurry to solve the case, so I would have to look into it myself for my own protection. Fifteen minutes later, I was following Mr. Buttons up the wide staircase to Tim Higgins' room. Let's get started, Mr. Buttons said, handing me another pair of latex gloves. In here, he added unnecessarily as he opened the door to a large bedroom. The bedroom was tidy. I always imagined that if police searched something, they made an awful mess. Perhaps I had watched too many crime shows on television after all. The carpet was an unappealing deep blue and sickly pink pattern, and the wallpaper was floral in shades mainly of navy blue. The heavy wooden bed was king-sized and had a thick blue and white quilt on it. There was a very feminine-looking dressing table with, of all things, a piano stool in a worn tapestry in front of it. The slight breeze through the partly opened window carried with it the faintest scent of mould. Heavy crimson velvet curtains completed the picture. I tried to draw them back further to let in more air, but they wouldn't budge. I crossed to the huge old desk, upon which was a large pile of books. What are we looking for exactly? You'll know it when you see it, Mr. Button said. I smiled and nodded, and we got to work. Mr. Buttons was working through the dresser full of clothes. 
They were all folded nicely. I watched him as he pulled each drawer open in turn. He reached in and pulled some of the pants up and ran his gloved fingertips along some paper. His brow quirked, and he pulled the pants out, setting them on the floor. Sybil, look at this. He pointed to thin stacks of loose leaf paper with slanting, scribbled writing in blue pen. He pulled out some of the sheets and handed them to me. I tried to read them, and at first had trouble because the handwriting was so bad. There were words, followed by numbers. I don't have a clue what this is, I said, handing the paper back to Mr. Buttons, once he had the rest in his hands. He was still crouched down, and he looked up at me. It doesn't look like a real language, like French, German, Spanish, or whatever. No language has words and numbers mixed together, and it can't be prices, as there are no dollar signs. He does have some English words, but then there are the strange symbols and the numbers. No, I agreed. It doesn't look like a language. Perhaps it's some sort of code. Mr. Buttons pulled out his iPhone and took photos of each sheet. I turned back to the desk. There were numerous, heavy volumes of Carter's Guide to Antiques and Collectibles, as well as stacks and stacks of every antiques, fine art, and collectibles magazine under the sun. Half an hour later, we had not found anything useful. Just a lot of books and magazines, I said, as we stood near the doorway. He was a reader, that's for sure, Mr. Buttons said. I wonder if I could match the handwriting on these papers to Mr. Higgins' writing. Did you come across anything that was obviously his writing? Yes, I said, and I hurried over to the bed. I pulled a small book from under the pillow and brought it back, handing it to Mr. Buttons, who opened it to reveal a date book. It was a year old, but there were various things scribbled on some of the dates, including birthdays and phone numbers. Mr. Buttons pulled one of the strange sheets of paper from where he'd put them on the top of the desk. He came around the front of the desk and bent over next to me, putting the date book and the paper side by side on the desktop in front of us. We leant forward together and studied both items. The E looks the same, and so do those letters, I said, pointing with my index finger. Yes, I'd say it's a match, Mr. Buttons said. I can't see how that will help us, though. I shook my head. I suppose not, but perhaps it will help later on somehow. Hang on a moment. I peered at the writing. I know what this is. How silly of me. Those symbols are silver hallmarks. I know, because Andrew's mother was always talking about her huge collection of antique silver. Look at this one here. It has the words Leon Passant, which is, of course, the symbol for sterling silver. And then that symbol there, I bet, is a leopard's head, which is the place, London, I think from memory. Then those ones are date letters and the maker's mark. He must have written this all down while looking at Cressida Silver and then gone to check it with one of those books. I nodded to the pile of books. And the numbers are what he thinks the items are worth, Mr. Buttons said. Yes, and I'd say he left the dollar sign off, just in case someone stumbled across it. It certainly fooled us for a while. What are we going to do? We have to give these to the police, but they'll say we're interfering with their investigation. Leave it to me, Mr. Buttons said. I'll just say I was cleaning Tim Higgins' room and stumbled across them. I thanked him, and we made our way back downstairs. After stopping to listen at the dining room door to check that the coast was clear, I followed Mr. Buttons to the kitchen. He went to a small coffee maker in the corner and turned it on, and soon the smell of freshly brewing coffee filled the place. Mr. Buttons also rinsed a teapot under hot water, so I assumed the coffee was solely for my benefit. I was certainly having a coffee overload today. I could almost smell the caffeine that I imagined was oozing from my pores. I made myself as comfortable as I could at the kitchen table and flipped through the small date book. Mr. Buttons set a coffee mug in front of me and a delicately painted teacup in front of his seat. I looked at Mr. Buttons and then realised with a start that he could be the murderer. I had certainly let down my guard with him. I couldn't afford to be so careless again. Chapter 11
I was at the veterinary clinic asking the receptionist if I could leave my business cards there, as well as a poster. Oh yes, my mobile grooming van is ideal, I gushed, waving my business cards under her nose. It has an electric grooming table, an autofill hydro bath, and an Air Max dryer. I have special shampoo and conditioner for the dogs with skin allergies, and I cater to all breeds. I do whatever clients want. I can do show clips for several breeds, including poodles, full clips for cats, blow dry, hydro baths. I do nails, ears, you name it. I had just paused for breath when a woman burst through the door, dragging an unwilling yellow Labrador behind her. She elbowed me aside and demanded to speak with the veterinarian. Come here, you bad dog, the woman snarled at the dog, who was pulling back, unwilling to proceed further into the waiting room. I'm sorry, but I have to help this young lady first, the receptionist said, but the woman interrupted her. I tell you I need you to help me urgently. This dog continues to dig holes in my pristine lawn and keeps on gnawing at our shoes. You have no idea how many times I've had to replace everything and pay the gardener to make sure the lawn's tidy again. You have to help me fix this dog or get rid of her for me somehow. The receptionist had her lips set in a tight, thin line. It was clear to me that her patience was wearing thin. However, she instead smiled politely at the rude woman and asked her to wait while she called the vet out to the reception room. She quickly mouthed a word of apology at me, the business cards briefly left forgotten on her desk. The receptionist soon returned with a vet. What seems to be the problem this time, Miss Davis? I've already explained it to that other woman, she snapped. This dog has no manners. She keeps digging holes. She slobbers all over the floor and she ate some of my sofa. I only managed to stifle a giggle with some effort, but my humour soon left when I saw the dog's sad face. I've already given you the name of a training group, the patient lady vet said. That won't help her, the overbearing woman said. She needs drugs. The vet shook her head. She's only seven months old. Chewing things is normal puppy behaviour. Have you provided her with an assortment of chew toys? Have you been taking her for daily walks, like I advised you to previously? The woman's cheeks puffed up. I can't walk. It makes me tired. I can't have this dog any longer. If you won't give her drugs, I'll take her to a shelter and leave her with them. I gasped and the woman turned her attention to me. Do you have something to say? No, I mean, yes, um, well, you can't take that lovely dog to a shelter. Who knows what will happen to her? The dog walked over to me and chewed on my shoe, then turned her big brown eyes up to my face. I stroked her head and made silly baby noises at her. She's adorable, I cooed. You take her then, she snapped in a waspish tone. I looked up at the woman. Are you serious? Yes, do you want her? I had been planning on getting a dog, but not yet, and not like this. I had deliberately looked for a cottage with a yard, a place where the landlord would allow me to have a dog, and that, in fact, was written in my lease contract. I took a deep breath. Yes, I'll have the dog. The leash was in my hand as fast as the woman could get it to me, and she turned to hurry away. Wait a minute, the vet said. This needs to be legal, Miss Davis. She turned to the receptionist. Do you have any change of microchip number forms handy? The receptionist soon produced a form, which Miss Davis signed, albeit unwillingly. I don't know why I had to pay to have this dog microchipped in the first place, she snapped. It's a waste of money. The receptionist shot me a look and then stood up. Miss Davis, all dogs and cats in Australia, by law, have to be microchipped. It's useful for locating owners of missing pets. Miss Davis muttered something to herself and hurried from the clinic. I filled in the form and signed it too. And just like that, I had a dog. The business cards I had come to deliver were quickly left forgotten, and I felt a little shell-shocked. The vet briefly smiled at me before hurrying back into a treatment room and I turned to the receptionist. I'll need to buy dog food. Is there anything else I need to buy? The receptionist looked at her computer. She's not due for worming for quite some time. Anyway, we'll send you a text the week before she's due. She'll need a car safety restraint. 
This one's good and cheap and clips straight in. She held up a small packet. Did you know that she's well-bred? Miss Davis paid quite a lot for her. Her parents had good hip and elbow scores. It's all in the computer. Which dog food would you like? My head was spinning. I looked at the shelves and was at once intimidated by the various types and brands of dog food, their silvery plastic packages shining under the two bright clinic lights. Which one is best for her? The receptionist pointed to one large bag. Labrador should stay on premium puppy food at least to the age of 18 months, she said, preferably a brand made for large breeds due to potential joint problems and the like. Okay, I said, handing her my credit card. I'll have the car safety restraint and the dog food, thanks. I also chose some chew toys. After I had paid, I was about to leave when I turned back. What's her name? The receptionist smiled. Sandy, good luck with her. Sandy, not the most original name, especially for a yellow Labrador. Oh well, she was too old to have a name change now. I shrugged and led Sandy to my car. As soon as I opened the back door, she hopped in nicely and allowed me to fasten her seatbelt. Oh, you're such a good girl, I gushed and was rewarded with a wet lick on my chin. After a quick detour to the supermarket to buy dog bowls, I went back home to my cottage. Home. It did feel like home now that I had a dog to share it with. I led Sandy through the cottage into the yard and let her go. I had already checked that the yard was dog-proof when I'd first arrived. I had planned to get a dog at some point, after all. Sandy ran around and explored it quickly and then ran back to me and put her paw on my knee. I do hope you're house-trained, I said, and Sandy put her head to one side as if to try to figure out what I was saying. We both went back inside. Sandy promptly jumped on the sofa and went to sleep, seemingly unconcerned about being in a strange place, while I booted up my laptop. I knew about cyanide, having been married to someone who was a chemical engineer for a sodium cyanide manufacturing plant, and whose favourite and highly boring topic of conversation had been cyanide. I knew that cyanide was not available for sale to the public and was very difficult to obtain. As Tim Higgins' murderer had now made an attempt on my life, it was in my interest to find out as much as I could, from the safety of my home, that is. Ten minutes later, Sandy was snoring, and I had not found out anything useful at all. I came across a story of a lottery winner who was a suspected cyanide victim, and the article said that cyanide was available to buy in India. I googled that and did find wholesalers of cyanide. Still, I expected that if someone had it brought into the country, there would be a record of it in customs, and the police would be onto it. I did the only thing I could think to do. I called the ex. What do you want? I sighed. Perhaps this was a bad idea. Hello to you too. Look, I'm not calling about the settlement. I just want to know where to buy cyanide. There was a long silence on the other end of the phone, and I wondered if he had hung up. Cyanide, he said. I shook my head. I hoped he wasn't going to make this difficult. Yes, cyanide, you know, the stuff you make. I was unable to keep the sarcasm out of my voice. The day I arrived here, one of the boarders was found dead. He was killed by cyanide. Fascinating, Sybil, but I have to get back to work. Look, Andrew, I just want to know this. Where can you buy cyanide? I know it's hard to get. I found out you can get it from India and Jamaica. Jamaica? Yes, he grunted. There was a spill in an Australian chemical factory there some years ago, and word on the street is that some people in Jamaica are still selling it. If you know where to look, you can buy it. Anywhere else? Probably, but I can't think of anywhere off the top of my head. Is that all? Some of us have to make a living, you know. I bit back my rude reply and simply said, Thanks. How's Max? None of your business. He's my cockatoo now. Do yourself a favour, Sybil, and get over it. With that, he hung up. I looked at my phone and squeezed it tightly, resisting the urge to throw it across the room. So, cyanide was available in India and Jamaica. How did that help me? 
As far as I knew, it didn't. I looked over at Sandy, only to see she was halfway through eating a cushion. Chapter 12 I had my first serious client. I had done many washes and clips before, but this was the first client for my fledgling Sybil's mobile pet grooming business in my new van. I was fortunate that the client had known my sister, what with the dog show scene being such a small world here on the east coast of Australia, and I assured her that I had prepared many of my sister's poodles for show. My sister had bred and shown toy poodles for years before she and her husband had gone to the United Arab Emirates to teach. I had learnt to do a pretty good poodle show clip over the years, and that's no mean feat, as they are time-consuming and complicated, so it was with relief, mixed with trepidation, that I learnt that my first customer wanted a Scandinavian trim. That's the show trim used outside Australia, and always on poodles under the age of 12 months here in Australia. I hoped the poodle had been trimmed recently, as otherwise the time for scissoring could be up to five hours, and I sure wouldn't enjoy that. The client did say that the trim shape was good and that she only wanted it shortened, but I'd heard that before. Still, it was always faster to shorten an already perfect shape rather than to change a style or shape. I was glad that the van had a large stand dryer, as it always takes hours of blow drying all the poodle hair straight before any scissoring takes place. I can't believe my luck having an experienced show poodle trimmer here in town, Susan, the new client, said by way of greeting as she peered inside the door of my van. Don't we ever need rain desperately? This is the driest season I can remember. I introduced myself. We had only spoken on the phone previously. I cast my eye over her dog, a delightful black toy poodle in, thankfully, a reasonably good state of trim. How long will it take? She asked. I've always done my own trims before, but I usually take several breaks, so I've no idea how long it takes to do it all at once. I stop for coffee or a piece of cake or to call a friend as it can be boring especially when I have to do several poodles at once. When she paused to take breath, I took my opportunity to speak. A wash, blow dry, clip and tidy up scissoring could take from two hours on up, depending on coat quality for drying and amount of hair to dry. I stroked the poodle's head and she licked my hand. So, did you learn to trim from your sister? I nodded. Pretty much. Susan nodded. Really, only people who show poodles learn how to do the trims. Show grooming is a much more specialised talent than the normal grooming they teach in courses. Most show groomers learn from friends or family. There are professionals who come to Australia and do seminars on the art, but no actual schools where you can go and learn. There are competitions for grooming, though. Did you ever win a prize at them? I nodded. Yes, I have, actually. Can I stay and watch? I frowned. Susan was the talkative type, and I didn't want to lose concentration. Besides, I didn't want her looking over my shoulder while I was grooming her poodle. I tried to think of a way out of it. The first step was to wash and condition the dog, and then blow dry all the poodle's hair straight and totally dry. Next was the clipping, including paws, face, and underneath. After that was the scissoring to shape the coat. No talking can happen while blow-drying or clipping, as the noise level is too high. Talking is possible during scissoring, but I did not want to talk to Susan. I have a policy of not talking while I'm grooming, I said, hoping what I'd made up on the spur of the moment would be believable. I hope you understand. It's just that I can't afford to lose concentration while doing something so important. Susan hastened to agree. Oh, yes, of course. Can I just stay while you're shampooing and conditioning? I sighed. Okay, then, but only while I'm shampooing and conditioning. You wouldn't like me to lose concentration while doing the clipping, would you? Susan shook her head. Don't forget all the areas that require clipping are sensitive, and you have to make sure that the clippers don't get too hot. I raised my eyebrows, but Susan hurried to add... 
Sorry about that. I know you know what you're doing. We went inside the van, and Susan was clearly impressed by the interior. Oh, you have that expensive brand of shampoo and conditioner, she gushed. It's the one I always use. Susan handed me the adorable toy poodle, which was full of personality. I placed her in the hydro bath. I soon lost myself in what I was doing, Susan's chatter receding from my consciousness, until she said, Jamaica. I looked up. Jamaica, I repeated. I stopped shampooing for a moment. Yes, Cressida Upthorpe's just returned from Jamaica. She said it was so lovely. The beaches, the people, the... I didn't listen to the rest as I was in shock. Cressida in Jamaica. She had just shot to the top of my suspects list. The next few hours were spent in deep concentration as I groomed, clipped and scissored the poodle and then delivered her to her satisfied owner. As I went back to my cottage, Mr. Buttons was standing at my gate, patting Sandy, who was slobbering all over his hand. Half of one of my socks was hanging out the side of her mouth. Sybil, Cressida told me you had a dog, he exclaimed with delight. I only got her yesterday, I said. Her name's Sandy. Yes, yes, Cressida told me the whole story. Can Sandy come and stay with me sometimes? I looked at Mr. Buttons and for the first time realised how lonely he was. Yes, of course. She can stay with you as much as you like. Mr. Buttons beamed. Thanks, Sybil. Perhaps I could walk her every day when you're too busy. My heart went out to him. Of course, I said. Chapter 13 Aren't you cute? I said to the King Charles Spaniel standing before me. He wriggled his bottom in response. His name is Buttons, his owner, a thin, nervous-looking woman, told me. Are you sure you can't shampoo him now? I shook my head. I have a dog booked in right now for a wash. In fact, he's running late. He should have been here by now. The woman's eye twitched, and she wrung her hands. The scent of stale lavender perfume and wilted roses clung to her. Please, please can you wash my dog? My mother-in-law's coming to stay tonight and she can't stand smelly dogs. I sighed. Okay, I suppose I could wash Buttons after I wash the next client. Buttons' owner was clearly delighted. Do you mind if I leave Buttons with you? And then I'll be able to clean the house without Buttons getting in the way. I sighed again more loudly this time. I suppose so. I have three crates in the back of the van. I'll have to shampoo him after my next client's dog. That is, if she actually shows up, I said as an afterthought. With that, Button's owner thanked me, handed me the leash, and was about to walk back to her car when she turned to me. There's just one thing, she said. Button's really hates having his clothes taken off, it's a real struggle to get them off. Thanks for the warning, I said dryly, looking down at the four layers of coats on the dog. I was about to escort the spaniel into the van when Mr. Buttons appeared. Hey, this dog appears to be named after you, I said with a laugh. Come on in, I have to put him in a crate. Mr. Buttons clapped his hands and hurried inside the van after me. I left him speaking in baby language to the dog and went back outside to see if my next client had arrived. If there was no sign of her or her Great Dane, then I would start on buttons. To my surprise, the woman was marching up the road, minus the dog. Miss Potts, I'm so sorry, she barked at me. I would have called, but I've had such a bad day, and I forgot to bring my mobile phone. Terminators refused to come. He doesn't like being washed. I didn't know what to say, but she pressed on. I do still want you to shampoo him, she said. I was walking here with him, and he sat down three blocks away. I tied him to a fence post, because I can't make him budge. Could you go and get him for me? He refuses to go in cars. I looked at the woman. I knew that she had been a major in the army and was now retired. She looked like she was still in the army and would brook no nonsense. In fact, she always introduced herself as Major Janelle Stevens. I was trembling a little just being in her presence. 
It's a wonder she wasn't armed. Well, can you go and get Terminator for me or not? She snapped when I didn't immediately respond. Her tone was commanding. I expected she thought I should salute. I would go and get him if I had the time, I said slowly. It just so happens that I have to give buttons a bath. It will take a while as well, given that he refuses to take off his clothes. I felt silly for saying clothes instead of coats, but too late, the words were out. She put her hands on her hips. I knew the woman was to be trusted and was a stalwart member of the community. In my stress that the morning was not running smoothly, I forgot that Mr. Buttons was already in my van. All right, then, I'll fetch your dog if you can go into my van and mind Buttons. I don't like to leave him by himself. Sure, the woman said. I hurried down the road in the direction of town to find her Great Dane. It concerned me that the dog was tied to a fence post, but I supposed the Major had no choice. If she'd had her mobile phone, she could have called for help, but as it was, I figured she had no other option. I found the Great Dane three blocks away, as she had said. He was a beautiful harlequin Great Dane, and he was sitting down looking as though he had no intention of going anywhere. I said his name and walked over to him. To my relief, he licked my hand. I untied his leash and tried to encourage him to walk. Come on, Terminator, I said. When he looked as though he were considering following me, I held a treat in front of his nose. That did the trick. He was up like a shot. Just then, as the treat was halfway to his mouth, a fat ginger cat ran past us. Terminator took off after it, jumping the white picket fence to which he had just been tied. I scrambled over the fence and flung myself at his leash. My fingertips just managed to grab the end of the leash, and once they did so, Terminator pulled me through a flower bed. I had a weird sensation of seeing rhododendrons, azaleas, daylilies, and gerberas flash past my eyes. Mercifully, the ginger cat climbed a tree, and Terminator came to a stop at the bottom. I struggled to my feet and seized Terminator's collar. I see you found a burst of energy after all, I said to the dog. I turned to see an irate woman hurrying towards me. Your dog chased my cat, she said angrily. I'm so sorry, I said. This actually isn't my dog. A lady tied him to your fence because he refused to walk any further, and she sent me to fetch him. I'm sorry he chased your cat. The woman calmed down somewhat. I couldn't blame her for being angry. I apologized again and beat a hasty retreat before she saw her garden. Yet before we had even reached her gate, Terminator threw himself down on the ground again and refused to move. I knew I had no hope of dragging a strong Great Dane down the road, and I didn't want to reward his bad behavior. Nevertheless, I figured he wasn't my dog, and I needed to get back to my van as soon as possible by any means. And so, treats it was. I managed to get the dog ever so slowly back to my van. He was happy to walk so long as he was chewing a treat, which he ate slowly and delicately for a Great Dane. But as soon as he had consumed each morsel, he would sit down and refuse to move. It took some time for us to reach the van, just as well I always kept plenty of treats in my pockets when working. Major Stevens must have heard me coming as she stomped out of my van. Great, you got him back here, she said with a grimace. I wondered how she would look if she were truly pleased. I thought you said you were in a hurry. I was perplexed. I am in a hurry, I said. Terminator refused to move and then stopped every minute or so. She folded her arms across her chest. Quite. Well, I shouldn't have thought you'd have time for picking flowers. I was puzzled by her words, until I ran my hands through my hair and pulled out a rhododendron. With that, several other flowers fell from my hair. I had no idea how to explain it, so I didn't try. Major Stevens still seemed annoyed with me. I thought you were in a hurry, she repeated in a petulant tone. So I took off Button's clothes and washed him for you. You were right. He sure hated having his clothes taken off. Then she smiled, a thin-lipped smile that looked as though it would cause her whole face to crack. 
It's kind of you to do that other work as well as your dog grooming business. Her large, meaty hand clamped down on my shoulder and squeezed it. I cringed. What other work? I managed to ask through the pain of a crushed shoulder blade. Your charity work, she said, with those less fortunate than we are. I was no further enlightened, but she continued. Still, I'm a bit puzzled that the state health services allow you to wash people in your dog bath. She shrugged. I suppose volunteers are hard to find. By now, I was convinced that the woman was stark raving mad. I had only heard around town that she was overbearing and bossy. Why hadn't anybody said that she was a first-rate lunatic? Anyway, because I caused you to be delayed, I washed buttons for you. And like I said, you sure were right. He really didn't like me taking his clothes off. He put up quite a struggle, but in the end I managed to get them off. Once I did, he was no trouble to bathe at all. I thanked her, but I was somewhat annoyed that she had taken it upon herself to wash the spaniel. I had insurance for that, and it wasn't her place. Nevertheless, I wasn't brave enough to point that out. She then marched off in the direction from which she had come, promising to come back in an hour to collect Terminator. I attempted Terminator inside the van with treats. There, in front of me, was a hideous apparition. I screamed. A suds monster sat in the dog bath. I was expecting to see the spaniel, but this creature was far bigger. As I gingerly edged forward to take a closer look, I saw Mr. Buttons sitting in the dog bath, bubbles surrounding him. He coughed, and bubbles frothed out of his mouth. Mr. Buttons, I said, whatever happened to you? Why on earth are you in the dog bath and uh, naked? It was that woman, Mr. Buttons said. She said you told her to bathe me. Then it dawned on me. Major Stevens had confused Mr. Buttons the human with Buttons the spaniel. I apologized profusely, but Mr. Buttons cut me short. I was upset at first, but then I quite enjoyed it, he said with a grin from ear to ear. I clutched my stomach as a wave of nausea hit me. Chapter 14 I had just had my morning coffee and a bowl of microwaved oatmeal. I'd lost the taste for cereal. When my phone rang, I looked at it in disbelief. Could this be another client? I didn't know the number. I hoped so. Hello, Sybil's mobile pet grooming, Sybil speaking, I said in an official tone. Hi, this is Barry Hetherington. I need you to come and wash my dog right now. It's an emergency, he said all at once. My wife's at work. I accidentally left the back door open, and her dog Gigi ran into the yard and rolled in the dirt. My wife's going to kill me. I have to rush to work now. If she comes home and finds Gigi all covered in dirt, I'll never hear the end of it. The man's voice rose in panic. No worries. It just so happens I'm free now and can come at once. What's your address? I wrote down his address and hurried over there. The district appeared to be in a newer part of town, the houses being all brick and expansive glass, with well-manicured lawns and barely any gardens to be seen. As I pulled my van over to the curb, a man hurried over to me. I'm late. You'll find Gigi in the house. When you've finished, can you leave the dog in the house and lock up? I own the Hetherington Art Gallery in the middle of town. Can you bring the keys to me there, and I'll pay you? I'm late. Thanks. He handed me the keys and ran to his car. I stood there, surprised that he would give me his house keys. After all, he didn't know me from a bar of soap. I walked up to the house to fetch Gigi. I didn't even know what breed the dog was, although I figured she'd be a girl with a name like Gigi. I unlocked the door and stepped inside, and a very dirty Maltese terrier hurried over to me, barking furiously and snarling. I couldn't blame her. For all she knew, I was an intruder, I had a moment of disquiet as I thought that I shouldn't have accepted the job so quickly. Nevertheless, it turned out that Gigi was all bluff. She soon rolled over so I could tickle her tummy. I picked Gigi up and headed for the door, the key in my hand. As I opened the door, I saw Sergeant Blake Wesley and Constable Wright hurrying down the path towards me. Blake had his hand on his gun. Hi, I said, wondering what was going on. 
What are you doing here? Blake snapped at me. Mr. Hetherington asked me to wash his wife's dog. I said, holding out the dog, which struggled and growled at him. Blake took a step closer to me. How did you get in? I didn't like his tone. I had done nothing wrong. What was he on about? He gave me his spare key, I said, none too politely. Constable Wright pushed past Blake. A likely story, he said. If he'd given you the key, he would have turned off the alarm. What alarm? I said. I didn't hear any alarm. It was a back-to-base, silent alarm, Blake explained in a patient tone, as if he were speaking to a child. Mr. Hetherington was in a rush. He obviously forgot and turned on the alarm. That's all, I said. I'm sorry, Sybil, Blake said. Put the dog back in the house, and you'll have to accompany us to the station. I put Gigi back in the house, and Blake locked the door. He indicated that I should walk ahead of him to the police car. He opened the door, and I got in the back seat. I felt awful, like some sort of criminal. Clearly, coming to Little Tatterford had been a huge mistake. Nothing had gone right from the second I had arrived here. Constable Wright looked over his shoulder at me. You are not obliged to say or do anything unless you wish to do so, but whatever you say or do may be used in evidence. Do you understand? He said. I was horrified and more than a little frightened. I'm not arrested, am I? And if so, aren't you supposed to read me my Miranda rights or something? Constable Wright made a strange sound, halfway between a snort and a laugh. We don't have Miranda rights in Australia. There's simply an obligation on police to caution a person in an interview that their statements may be used in evidence. You've been watching too much TV. Not really, I said. I only watch Murdoch Mysteries, CSI, and Law and Order. My voice trailed away. Why on earth had I said that? I tended to ramble when I was nervous. Do I look like a criminal? I added. Constable Wright had turned back to the front while I was speaking, but now looked over his shoulder at me again. Put it this way, Miss Potts. There hasn't been a murder in this town for years. There was a murder the very day that you arrived in town and right in the boarding house where you're staying. I could have pointed out that I was not staying at the boarding house, but rather the cottage, but thought it better to remain silent. The whole time, Blake sat behind the wheel and appeared to be focused on driving. He did not say a word. Five minutes later, I was sitting in the little waiting room at the police station while Blake had gone away. I assumed to call Mr. Hetherington. I looked around the room. It was sterile and depressing. The walls were pale green and the seats were black and hard. Two women sat on the opposite side of the room and they occasionally shot me dark looks. Constable Wright came out and also shot a look at me and then left by the front door. He came back quite some time later and I was still sitting there, bored and irritated. He went into Blake's office and then came straight back out. Miss Potts, Sergeant Wesley will see you now. Blake muttered to himself and then looked up at me. He indicated that I should sit opposite him. The chair was old and worn, about the same as I felt. I can't contact Mr. Hetherington. His mobile phone rang out and Constable Wright went to the art gallery, but there was no one there. It was shut. I can't verify your story. I knew he was only doing his job, but it rankled. My story, I said. It wasn't my fault. Blake leant back in his seat and put his hands behind his head. I can't believe a complete stranger would give you a spare key to his house. It's the truth, I said, somewhat annoyed. My sister used to be a realtor, and she was always saying how weird it was that complete strangers gave her keys to their houses. Well, you have an answer for everything, don't you? Before I could hit Blake with a rude reply, he continued, Sybil, can't you stay out of trouble? I was furious. It's not my fault, I said, standing up. None of it. I've done nothing wrong, and I don't like your attitude. You're being most unfair. Just then his landline rang. From the conversation that ensued, I could tell it was Mr. Hetherington. After a few moments, Blake looked up at me. Mr. Hetherington apologizes. 
He was in such a rush that he set the alarm automatically without thinking. He had a flat tire on the way to the art gallery and he left his mobile phone in the house by mistake. He wants to know if you will go over there now and wash his dog. I thought of all the things I would like to say to both Blake and Mr. Hetherington, although I could see that Mr. Hetherington was just having a really bad day. He wasn't the only one. Besides, I couldn't let down a new client, even one who had nearly had me arrested, albeit inadvertently. Tell him I'll be right there, I said through clenched teeth, assuming one of you drives me back to my van. I folded my arms across my chest. When Blake hung up, he said, Look, Sybil, I'm sorry. I whirled around and walked out of the police station as fast as I could. Chapter 15 I was beginning to be more than a little sorry that I had ever moved to Little Tatterford. I had only just barely escaped being arrested, and now Cressida Upthorpe, my number one suspect, had invited me to dinner at the boarding house. Surely she couldn't poison me there, in front of witnesses. I hoped not. Yet what could I do? There was no way I could refuse her dinner invitation. As I approached the expansive house and the dry paddocks surrounding it, streams of fear swept through my veins. The scene around me was eerie and dreadful. Dark clouds loomed above. There was a cold, chill wind, and the house still looked like something straight out of an old horror movie. I wanted to do nothing more than to run back to my cottage. I took a deep breath and crossed the path towards the house. I steadied my hand to reach for the door, but was startled when it swung open. Sybil, I'm so happy you're here. Come in. Cressida had a warm smile on her face. She opened the door wide so I could enter. I followed Cressida into the house, pausing to stroke Lord Farrington. This time Cressida led me through a small room, which held a small square table and some old dead flowers. Behind that were two old red couches covered with yellowing crocheted cushions. The rest of the room was filled with antiques and piles of dusty leather-backed books crammed onto numerous bookshelves. Come this way, Sybil. Lord Farrington told me that Mr. Buttons is waiting for us in the dining room. I was relieved that Mr. Buttons was already there. I wasn't sure I could sit through dinner with Cressida alone. Cressida led me into the large dining room with its long rectangular table spreading from one end of the room to the other. Four brightly lit candles in silver candlesticks rested on top of the table, which was adorned with exquisite china and wine glasses. It was as if Cressida was expecting the royal family for dinner. Clearly she, or more likely Alison, had put quite some time and effort into this occasion. Sybil, it's so good to see you. Mr. Buttons said, rising from his chair at the dining table and nodding at me. Nice to see you too, Mr. Buttons. I chatted with Mr. Buttons, doing my best to keep the image of him in the dog bath from my mind, while Cressida disappeared in the direction of the kitchen, followed by Lord Farringdon. Mr. Buttons and I soon ran out of things to say, so we just sat and smiled at each other awkwardly. When Cressida returned, my palms grew sweaty and I felt sick to my stomach. Is she going to poison me? I wondered. Surely not, not in front of witnesses. I stared at the food suspiciously. My palms were sweating, and my breathing was heavy. I fought the urge to run from the room. I put on a brave face and subtly smelled the wine placed in front of me. My hands shook, so I placed them in my lap. I looked up and locked eyes with Mr. Buttons, who was looking at me suspiciously. Cressida, I heard that you've recently returned from a vacation in Jamaica, I said. I watched her face carefully for any reaction. Oh, yes. She took the pair of long feather earrings from her ears and dangled them in front of me. A very friendly raster man on the beach sold these to me for such a good price, so cheap. People are so nice there. She slipped the earrings back in her ears and sipped her wine. I didn't know much about Jamaican jewellery or the type of food they had there. However, thanks to my ex-husband's endless droning on about his work, 
I did know a thing or two about the Jamaican cassava plant, and I was certain it contained cyanide if not prepared properly. Did you bring any cassava plants back? Cressida looked at me as if I were mad. Of course not. That would be illegal. I'd never get any food through customs. I felt like an idiot. No food was allowed through customs. How silly of me. I noticed that Mr. Buttons was staring curiously at my odd behaviour. How is he so calm? I wondered. Can't he connect the dots? What was Jamaica like? I asked, as I couldn't think of anything else to say. Oh, my. Jamaica was amazing. I was a little sad about going on my own. But once I got there, the locals made me feel right at home. Jamaicans are wonderful people, so warm, happy and friendly. Did you go to any interesting places? Mr. Buttons asked. Cressida beamed. I went to so many places. They have a beautiful natural falls called Dunn's River Falls, which was just around the corner from my hotel in Ocho Rias. Then I went to Dolphin Cove to swim with the dolphins. And on my last two days, I travelled to Negril, which is on the far west shore of the island. I went cliff diving and snorkelling there. Cressida let out a loud sigh of happiness. There's truly something special about Jamaica. In Negril, I met a really nice Rastafarian man who makes jewels and craft. He was the one who sold me these earrings. Mr. Buttons set down his fork. I'd like to head to Jamaica one day too. Cressida laughed. Oh, you'd love it there. May I use the bathroom? I asked. I needed some space to get my head together. I was failing miserably at playing detective, but I could hardly come straight out and ask Cressida if she had illegally obtained cyanide in Jamaica. Sure, it's the second door on the left, right down the far corridor, Cressida said, before turning to tell Mr. Buttons more tales about Jamaica. I struggled to find my way to the bathroom. The narrow hall was dark, the only lighting coming from a window at the end of the corridor. The light coming through the worn lace curtains created a spectral shadow on the paintings hanging on the wall. On the way back from the bathroom, one particular painting caught my eye. It was an oil painting of a handsome man, perhaps in his late twenties or early thirties. The picture looked like it was from the 1990s. His brown eyes popped out of the frame, and his black hair fell over one eye. His chiseled features and boyish good looks were captivating. I was surprised at just how handsome he was, and how pleasant he appeared. I was also surprised that he was holding a three-headed dog. Cerberus, the guardian of the underworld, or just another example of Cressida's bizarre artistic bent? Probably both. I stared at the picture for a long time. I had heard that Cressida had been married before and that the estate had been his family's. Had she poisoned her husband to gain the inheritance? And even if she had, what possible motive would she have had for poisoning Tim Higgins? Or trying to kill me, for that matter? I jumped as Cressida appeared behind me. Just wondering if you got lost, Sybil. You seem to be taking a long time. I felt guilty, although I hadn't exactly been doing anything wrong. Is that your former husband? The painting is quite realistic, photographic almost. Why would you change perfection? Cressida fixed me with a steely gaze. Paintings, photographs, both catch an image at its truest. The ones who want to change them are usually the disillusioned and liars. I'm a firm believer in leaving a great thing as it is. What good does unnecessary change do? I do not approve of impressionist paintings and the like. I looked at her more closely. How can I argue with such logic? I said, not knowing what else to say. Cressida's face returned to its sunny state. I knew you were an honest one. She turned her attention back to the painting. Lord Farrington told me that people in this town are saddened by this murder. If only the police could have pretended and told them it was suicide. I thought you loved the honesty and unchanging nature of photographic art, I said before thinking. But I'm not a photograph, am I? Cressida countered. I'm just a flawed human with a canvas. 
I paint pictures to capture the truth, so I'm reminded of what it means never to lie. I took in her words. She seemed just as strange as ever. I hoped the police were making progress with this case, as I certainly wasn't. I followed Cressida back to the dining room to join Mr. Buttons. When I sat down, my plate was just as I had left it, while Mr. Buttons and Cressida were soon busily chatting away. I half-heartedly speared a piece of baked potato with my fork. Cressida peered at me. Are you all right, Sybil? Lord Farrington just told me that you haven't touched your food and you've barely said a word all night. I sat silent for a moment, debating my options, and then decided to take the coward's way out. You know, I'm not that hungry. I haven't been feeling so well these past couple of days. I think I might have to head home. I'm so sorry. I hope you don't mind. Not a problem at all. Cressida's tone was sincere. Would you like me to pack your dinner so you can have it later tonight if you feel better? That's very kind of you, but I wouldn't be able to eat it. That part, at least, was true. Mr. Buttons, Cressida and Lord Farrington followed me to the door as Mr. Buttons and Cressida continued to make small talk. After we said our goodbyes, I walked outside, huddling into my coat as an icy chill had descended. I had a moment of unease and looked back at the house. There, in a high window, was the face of a woman staring down at me. No light could be seen from the room, but the image of the woman was clear. When the woman saw me looking at her, she ducked behind the curtain. Was it Alison or Nora? I couldn't tell at this distance. Chapter 16 The early morning air was hazy, the light soft, as I sat at my small round dining room table in the corner of the kitchen in my minuscule cottage. Sandy was lying at my feet, chewing on the edge of the table instead of her chew toy. There was a mug filled with coffee in front of me, the steam rising in large looping spirals from it. I huddled over the top of it with my hands on either side of the ceramic cup, using it to warm myself. I had discovered that the wood fire did not burn all night, so I faced a cold house every morning. It was early winter, and I had been warned that the nightly temperatures would soon drop well below freezing. Perhaps I needed larger logs of wood. I would have heard the police car pull up to my cottage if I hadn't been daydreaming about ways to make the fire last longer. I thought I heard a slight squeal of brakes, but I paid it no attention, and the only time I became aware that I had visitors was when there was a heavy knock on my front door. I had no inkling of who could be visiting me at that time, so there was nothing for me to do but get up from the table, take my mug along for the ride, and head to answer the door. I was barely able to keep my face from contorting with surprise when I saw the two uniformed police officers on my front porch, Blake and Constable Gordon Wright. Constable Wright wore sunglasses, even though it wasn't really bright enough for them. Blake glanced at me when I opened the door and then turned his head, making a show of looking across my front yard, leaving the other cop to be the one to speak. At that point, Sandy ran past me and jumped up on the two officers, trying to lick their faces. She was beside herself with excitement. Excuse me, I'll just go put her out the back, I said, dragging the over-exuberant Labrador towards the back door. I shut the back door and hurried to the front door, my heart in my mouth. Miss Potts? Constable Wright asked, and I nodded my head, not yet having found my voice. It was early, and my caffeine levels were low. He knew who I was. He had been there at the whole unfortunate alarm incident. We've had an anonymous tip that we can find a stolen painting in your cottage, he said. I was shocked, and my jaw fell open. A stolen painting? Yes, ma'am, the man said. That's ridiculous. What painting? They didn't answer, so I stepped back and set my mug down on the small table near the door where I threw my keys whenever I got home. I looked at them. Come in, I said, without really thinking about it. But the look Blake shot me was enough to make me instantly regret being so inviting. What kind of rights had I just given up, letting them in so easily? I didn't know, 
but I bet it hadn't been a good idea. Still, I hadn't done anything wrong. Both officers stepped inside. Tell me about the painting I supposedly have, I said, hoping that my voice wasn't shaking. Constable Wright glanced around my small living room and then turned to me. It's by Ian Blakely. I searched my mind for Ian Blakely, but I came up short. I didn't know too much about art, but I knew the big names in Australian art. Arthur Boyd, Sidney Nolan, Brett Whiteley, Tom Roberts, Albert Namajira, John Passmore, William Dobell, and I was still recalling names when the constable spoke again. An anonymous tip said you have the painting here. An anonymous tip? Not many people know I'm living here, I said. Blake spoke up. We have to check out all cases of anonymous tips. Constable Wright shrugged. Mind if we look around? He asked. I looked at Blake, who was standing a little distance behind the other cop, and when our eyes met, Blake mouthed the word warrant. I was worried that would make me look guilty, so I turned back to the constable and nodded. Go ahead, I said, but Blake shook his head softly as Constable Wright smiled. Thank you so much, Sybil, the constable said in a slick voice that made me feel uncomfortable. I did not like him using my name. I opened my mouth to tell him to call me Ms. Potts, but I thought better of it and held my tongue. Do you mind waiting outside? He asked. It's a small place and it would be easier that way. You don't have to, Blake said. I'll stay, I said, earning a small nod of approval from Blake. Suit yourself, Constable Wright said, as he pulled a small camera from his pocket and strode into the centre of the living room. He began taking pictures, turning in a slow circle and he repeated the process in the kitchen, my bedroom, and the tiny bathroom as well, before he even started touching anything. After he finished taking photos, however, he certainly did start touching. He opened drawers, emptying them out on the floor. He lifted the mattress on the bed and left it leaning on an angle. All the while, Blake was searching as well, but I could tell he was taking more care, working not to disturb my home too much. An hour passed, and I was shocked that a search of my tiny place could take so long. I was beginning to grow resentful towards Constable Wright. I glared at him. He was tall and broad, with a slight belly, his hair thick. His face was handsome with a wide jaw and a nose that had been broken once. The cop caught me looking at him and grinned, his lips curling in an unpleasant manner. Well... It looks like I got some bad information, huh? I guess so, I said sharply. Blake was drifting towards the front door, but Constable Wright remained in the centre of the living room. He craned his neck, looking at the ceiling. What's that? he asked. What? Blake and I said in unison, and Blake came over to stand beside the officer. He pointed upwards, and I saw that there was a small square hatch in the ceiling, I had never noticed it before. How do you get up there? Blake asked, looking at me. I shrugged, worried that they were interested in the hatch. I've never noticed it before, I said. There's got to be a ladder out in the shed, Constable Wright said. There might be. I haven't looked around out there yet, I said, and the officer left to check. What's up there? Blake asked in a quiet voice, and I felt myself growing annoyed. I told you I don't know anything about it, I snapped. I just moved here. Blake nodded, and then Constable Wright was back, banging through the screen door with an old wooden ladder. He unfolded it and placed it under the hatch, then climbed the ladder quickly. The hatch was a wooden square which lifted upwards. We call them manholes in Australia. They are for access to the roof space, as Australian houses very rarely have attics. Seems to be empty up here, Constable Wright called, and I breathed a sigh of relief. Hang on, there's something here. He soon climbed back down the ladder with a large black bag under one arm. Then he went to the couch, placed the bag upon it, and unzipped it. Blake and I crowded in behind him as he finished the zipper and reached inside the bag. Out came a painting, 
a landscape of an Australian scene of the early colony days, the painted sunlight falling at an angle over half of the picture. Aha, uh -huh, Constable Wright said softly, leaving the painting on the couch and turning to me. Sybil Potts, you're under arrest. He stepped forward, but Blake stepped between us and held his hands up. Now wait just a minute, Blake said. She just moved in here. She says she doesn't know anything about it, and I'm inclined to believe her. I can see why you would be inclined to believe such a sweet little thing, Sergeant. But the fact is, we got a tip that said her name, and said it would be at her new house, and there it is. That's good enough for me, and I know it's good enough for you. I'm telling you, it's not, Blake said firmly. Constable Wright made to step around Blake, but Blake cut him off. This is what will happen, Constable. He emphasised the word constable as if to remind him that it was a lower rank than sergeant. I'm going to take the painting down to my office, and I'm going to leave Miss Potts right where she is until I get some more information. I will, however, send out the fingerprint team. Constable Wright was fuming. His lips were thin, his eyebrows furrowed down so much they were almost meeting in the middle of his forehead. Finally, he took a deep breath and stepped away. He narrowed his eyes at me. Don't go anywhere, all right? You have enough on your plate apart from running from this, too. I didn't know about the painting, I snapped. I was scared. It was clear that someone had framed me. But who? Had Cressida tried to poison me last night, and having failed, tipped them off as to the painting's whereabouts? Constable Wright ignored me. I'll be outside, he said to Blake over his shoulder as he turned away. Blake went to the painting, put gloves on, and slid it back into the bag. Sorry about that, Blake said. Try to stay out of trouble. I am trying, I said. I haven't done anything wrong. Blake nodded and left, and I was left with a somewhat messy house. I started to clean up, but my curiosity got the better of me. I sat on the couch and pulled my small laptop onto my lap. I typed in Ian Blakely, and his paintings came up. One looked just like the one the cop had found in the hidden space in my house that I didn't even know I had. One of the first links I clicked on was about its theft, and I read the entry. A private collector in a town called Warwick had owned it, along with some other art. Several paintings had been stolen from his private collection three years ago. The collector was a man who had wished to remain anonymous, and I was unable to pull any other information about him through any other articles. Still, something kept prodding my mind as I clicked through each article about the theft. Finally, it came to me. Warwick. I had heard the town's name somewhere else only recently. Then I remembered. Mr. Buttons had said Warwick was where Tim Higgins had lived until he moved to the boarding house. I shut my computer and sat back, and slowly a plan formed in my mind. Chapter 17 I knew I wasn't supposed to go anywhere, but within a half hour of deciding to go to Warwick, I had delivered Sandy to a delighted Mr. Buttons, had an overnight bag packed, and was throwing it into my mobile pet grooming van. I climbed behind the wheel and started the engine. It started on the third go, and off I went. I had GPS on my phone, though service dipped and dropped completely, but Warwick wasn't hard to get to. It was just time-consuming, being several hours away. A few hours into the trip, I realised it was well past lunch and I hadn't eaten all day. I stopped off the highway and went through a drive through eating a burger and sucking down a milkshake as I got back onto the road. I wondered what Blake was going to say if he found out I had left. It was worse still that I had gone away right after the constable had told me not to go anywhere. I decided I really didn't care all that much. After all, the constable hadn't said, don't leave town, like they do in the movies. This was serious. Someone was framing me. I didn't think Constable Wright cared much about who he fingered with the crime. He just wanted to close the case. 
That left it all up to me, and I would do what I could to clear my own name. The sun was just starting to fall when I reached Warwick, and I found a small motel built a bit back from the main stretch of road in town. I stopped at the front office and got myself a room. I quickly let myself into the room and looked around. It was just like any other motel room, nice enough but unremarkable. After freshening up, I left my van parked there and walked back to the main road, moving up and down the street as I looked in the windows of the shops, all of which were either now closed or getting ready to close. I had a bit of a start when I saw the antique store. It was brick and nondescript, with brass letters hanging over the doorway. I recognised it. It had been Tim Higgins' place. I had seen a picture of it in a scrapbook of sorts that he had kept when I had gone through his room. I tried the door, but it was locked, and I resolved to come back first thing in the morning once they had opened. I walked back to the motel and got some dinner from a dingy vending machine sitting in a covered hall a few doors down. I went back to my room and ate my fattening loot, and then I took a shower. I got into bed, made myself as comfortable as I could, and tried to go to sleep. Sleep did not come, so I turned on the TV and watched late-night talk shows until I finally drifted off. The following morning, I dressed and walked into town. The antique store had been open for six minutes by the time I got there. As I pushed the door open, a small brass bell chimed over my head, and a thin woman, around the age of fifty or so, I guessed, came out from behind the counter near the back of the store. Hello! she said with a smile. We could do with some rain. By now, I was used to people in the country greeting me with mention of what the rain was or wasn't doing. As I made my way to her, the thin woman was joined by someone who could only be her husband, a thin man himself, but taller than maybe anyone I had ever seen. Hi, I have some questions, I said, and the couple looked at me with interest. Well, we'll try to help you as best we can, the man said. I was a little discomforted, wishing I had said something to indicate that I was not coming to look at antiques. Do you know Tim Higgins? I said, figuring there was no point beating around the bush. The couple looked at one another. Why do you ask? The woman said. I know him, well, not really, but he lived near me, I said. We never knew whatever happened to him, the man said, and that's all right with us. I'm Sybil, by the way, I said, offering my hand across the counter. The couple took turns shaking it and introduced themselves as Kathy and Bob. You bought this store from Tim? I asked. Why are you asking, if you don't mind? Kathy asked. Tim died the other day. There are some questions about his death. Oh, my. Kathy said. And you're a police officer? Bob asked. No, I said. I'm just doing some digging, trying to help. I see, Bob said, but it was clear he didn't, really. Well, we didn't know him well, but we bought the place from him when he was selling some years ago. Gosh, I guess it must be almost ten years now. He and his wife were moving. He had a wife, he shrugged. I don't know if they were actually married, but they were living together. They were inseparable, in all things, I guess you can say. That got my interest. What do you mean by that? When we bought the place, the police came through and took inventory of everything, literally marked down everything in the shop. Something was going on with those two, and everyone here in town knew it. We had always loved the shop. We love antiques, but dealing with them... Well, it wasn't pleasant. When they announced they were selling it, we both quit our jobs and bought it. It's been a dream come true, Bob said. Only we had to keep an under new management sign in the window for a year, Kathy added, to let everyone know that reputable people had taken over. What had they been doing? I asked. Maybe dealing in stolen goods, Bob said. It's a pretty big racket for this industry, if you care to put your life and reputation on the line. I nodded. I had guessed as much. And the police went after them? I don't think they ever got them on anything, 
Bob said. And he had a wife, a partner. Had they been together long? I asked. It had seemed odd that no one in Little Tatterford had mentioned his partner, and I hadn't seen anything in his room to indicate he had one. I think they had been. We moved here in our early twenties and they were together, and that was twenty years ago. They were together ten years after that when they left here. I thought for a moment. I didn't know how and if Tim was involved with the stolen painting, but the timeline didn't work out quite right if he had left town ten years ago and the painting was stolen three years ago. What did his partner look like? She was a fair bit younger, Kathy said, short and slim, blonde hair. I shook my head. Do you know about the paintings that were stolen from a collector in town three or so years ago? The married couple looked at one another and they seemed to hesitate together. Finally, Bob spoke. We heard about it, of course. Do you know who the collector was? He doesn't want to be bothered, Bob said somewhat sharply, and I knew not to ask any more questions about it. Well, thanks for your time, I said. I didn't bother to shake their hands again, as the mood in the shop had taken a noticeable turn, and the chilly glares I got told me all I needed to know. I turned and headed back out to the street. I had only gone half a block back towards the motel when I paused. I turned, having had the undeniable feeling of someone watching me. There were a few people out walking in the morning, and a couple of cars buzzed by. A group of schoolchildren ran by, hurrying to the corner where the school sat. I couldn't see anyone looking at me, but I knew I hadn't imagined it. I turned and hurried back to my motel. I used the small key I was given at the desk to open my room, and at once a sense of nausea passed over me. The vision came out of nowhere, a vision of someone going through my things at my cottage. In my vision, I walked into my cottage, and I looked over to where I kept a few of my makeup items out on a table. They were in a different position. The vision faded as quickly as it had begun. I hurried to pack my small bag and then checked out. I couldn't wait to get out of Warwick. I hurried out to the road and then the few miles to the highway, which would take me back home. I couldn't shake the feeling of having been watched and the feeling of being violated by having some unknown person go through my stuff. I felt queasy and shortly after getting on the highway, I had to pull over as hot tears stung my eyes. They were tears of fear and anger. I couldn't stop them. I just had to let them fall down my cheeks while cars sped by me on the highway. Eventually, I got everything under control. I merged back into traffic and started for home once more. I only stopped three times, once when I needed gas and twice for snacks. I didn't dare speed in case I got a ticket, and then the horrible Constable Wright would know that I had left town. It was late afternoon when I pulled into my dirt driveway in front of my cabin. I hurried inside, and sure enough, my makeup items were all out of position. Someone had indeed been here, going through my things. I locked both doors and wedged chairs against them, then went through the small house and locked the windows as well. Sandy was with Mr. Buttons, so I had no concerns there. As it was winter, it was already dark, and I turned on every light in the house and lit the fire before huddling in front of it. There was nothing quite as comforting as a wood fire, but my shivering was not only caused by the cold, it was also caused by fear. Chapter 18 the previous night, my sleep had been uneven and uneasy, and I had awoken often. I couldn't shake the feeling that I had been followed and spied upon the previous day, and I was worried that someone had been through my home. Still, the night passed without incident, and in the morning, just as the sun was rising, I got out of bed. I waited until the stores on Main Street would be open, meanwhile taking a hot shower, both to warm up and to pass the time. The second my iPhone read nine, I picked up my laptop and climbed into my van. 
I drove down the main street and parked in front of a small coffee shop that seemed to have been wedged between two bigger buildings, a laundromat on one side and a bank on the other. I managed to reverse the van with some difficulty, taking up two parking spaces. Still, there weren't many cars on the street, so I hoped no one would mind. I decided to have a good look around the town and check out the shops. I was soon captivated by one store which had heavily scented candles as well as unusual lamps and cushions, all at good prices. I stood for some time trying to decide between one candle with a triple fragrance of caramel, vanilla and coconut and another which boasted a triple fragrance of gardenia, patchouli and sandalwood. I eventually chose the latter. I also could not resist a shabby chic silk lampshade complete with lampstand. It appeared to have been made with strips of pale pink raw silk tied at the top with the palest blue brocade which was held in place by an Art Nouveau clasp. It was more than I wanted to spend, but I wanted a lampstand next to my bed so I could read at night and then go to sleep without having to get out of bed to turn off the light. This was especially important in winter. I had no desire to leave my electric blanket and climb out into the icy air. The warmth of the wood fire did not extend to my bedroom. I packed my finds into my van and picked up my laptop just as my mobile phone vibrated. I looked at the number. It was my lawyer. Immediately my stomach churned, so I sat down in the passenger seat in the van and took a deep breath before answering. Hello, bad news, was the first thing I said. Not exactly, came the official voice. Your husband, Sorry, ex-husband, has agreed to let you have the cockatoo in exchange for $5,000 of the property settlement. I was elated and confused at the same time. So you're saying I can have Max, and I don't have to pay for him now? It will come out of the property settlement later? Yes, my lawyer said, but I must advise you against it. That is an unacceptable overinflated price for a cockatoo. I suggest we wait it out, wait until the property settlement, and claim the bird as part of the property settlement. No judge will think it reasonable that you pay $5,000 for a bird. He's not just a bird, I said. He's my Max. Yes, I'll do it. My lawyer attempted to interrupt me. Sybil, I must advise you. I cut him off. No, I'm going to get Max. How soon can I do it? I'll call his lawyer and then call you straight back. My lawyer sounded weary. It was obvious he thought I was making a big mistake. I sat in the van wringing my hands for what seemed like an age, waiting for the call. I was about to call my lawyer back when he called me. Sybil, your ex-husband said you can collect Max tomorrow from his work. I thought for a moment. That was short notice and it meant two plane rides but at least I didn't have to wait before collecting Max. I'll do it, I said. Make sure he has the photo albums there too. After speaking some more about the paperwork, I hung up. I got my laptop out of the van and hurried inside the cafe. It was surprisingly empty, and I moved right up to the counter and ordered a latte from the barista, a young woman in her late teens with blonde hair and a crooked smile. I paid for the drink, before moving to one of two wobbly chairs at a small circular table by the roaring wood fire. I took a sip of my latte and opened the laptop. There was free Wi-Fi in the cafe. To my surprise, my laptop connected to the internet at once. I immediately went to the flight center's website and booked a return flight to Rockhampton, which was the closest town to where my ex-husband worked. I also booked a flight for Max, and as it was such short notice, I had no choice but to buy the airline's expensive bird carrier crate. The whole exercise was expensive, as flights are always more costly if booked at the last minute. But I had no other option. I wanted Max back as soon as I could get him. When the bookings were complete, I rewarded myself with a slice of chocolate ganache cake. I sipped my latte and turned back to my laptop, this time searching for Tim Higgins. I started wading through all the Tim Higgins entries that came up, trying to find the one I wanted. It took me some time to find him, and the Wi-Fi kept dropping out. 
but find him I did. I learned his middle name was Eugene. Luckily for me, he appeared to be the only Timothy Eugene Higgins in Australia. When I added his middle name, a few sparse details popped up, but they were all about him. I scrolled through images, disappointed not to see any of Tim with a woman. You know, I don't think I've actually seen you wash a dog, a voice said. I jumped in my seat and looked up. There was Blake, standing over me with his thumbs hooked in his belt. I slammed my laptop shut. Oh, sorry, I didn't see you there. The sergeant was holding a steaming travel mug of coffee, and he placed it on the table and sat down opposite me without being invited. He looked across at me. We had the coffee and cereal analysed. There was nothing in the coffee, but they found traces of barbiturates in your cereal. Not enough to kill you, but enough to make you fall asleep at the wheel. I was upset by the news, but not overly surprised. After all, I'd had the vision. I was wondering whether I should mention the vision, just to rub it in. After all, I didn't like being thought of as a nut job. When he spoke again, what are you doing? He asked. Research, I said somewhat defiantly. Yesterday I drove up to Warwick and dug into Tim Higgins. I went to his old antique store. The new owners say he was married, but I can't find his wife anywhere. Blake considered this for a moment. Maybe they just lived together. Maybe they weren't married. We knew nothing of any wife. Yes, sorry. They said they didn't know if he was married or not, but they were sure he had a woman in his life long term. Mm -mm, Blake muttered. And they, um, they thought he was doing things, maybe selling stolen goods, stuff like that. So the painting, it could be, well, you know, it could be something he was doing. They seemed sure he was up to something. Why are you doing this? The question caught me off guard. What do you mean? Someone came after you, you know. You could have been killed. Are you looking to keep it going? I wilted under his gaze. I want to figure this out. Blake stood up and placed his hat upon his head. He grabbed his coffee and took a sip. Well, that's my job, he said sternly, and then he turned to go. He headed for the front door, rested his hand on it, and pushed it open. Then he turned back and shook his head softly. Just stay out of trouble. I mean it. Chapter 19 I was only halfway to the airport and already dreading the rest of the journey. I was on my way to Rockhampton to meet my ex-husband and finally collect my childhood photo albums and, more importantly, my cockatoo, Max. Unfortunately, this meant driving to the airport from Little Tatterford, flying to Brisbane on a tiny and very uncomfortable plane, then taking a connecting flight to Rockhampton itself. All in all, it wasn't the most unpleasant or lengthy journey, but I was dreading the encounter with Andrew. It would be worth it, though. I was sick of empty promises and knew that if I didn't go and get this sorted myself, I'd never get my hands on Max again. Plus, the flight from Brisbane to Rockhampton is actually a bearable one, on a much nicer plane than the little one from Little Tatterford to Brisbane. The flight is only an hour and a half. Better yet, the return trip would be even nicer, since I wouldn't have to worry about seeing Andrew and I would have Max. I arrived early to the airport, as was my habit. Normally, punctuality wasn't a big worry for me, but missing my plane would have caused all sorts of unnecessary problems, and you never know how long it takes to get through security. While waiting, and when squished into my little seat on the flight itself, I spent my time thinking over recent events. At the moment, I had three prime suspects. Cressida, who might have poisoned her ex-husband, Mr. Buttons, who had cleaned up the crime scene directly after the incident, and who'd had easy access to Tim Higgins' meals and my own kitchen, and Alison. Alison had the same ease of movement as the rest, although no known possible access to cyanide, and as far as I could tell, no real motive. I couldn't discount the possibility that they were working together somehow, but that felt extremely unlikely. 
It could also be someone else entirely. Nevertheless, this whole mess was too much to think about with the impending Andrew Apocalypse, so I put these thoughts aside and tried to enjoy the rest of my trip. The second flight was a much more pleasant experience, with better seating, service, meals, and movies. At only an hour and a half of flight time, I didn't get the chance to see an entire movie, but the fact that they had them playing at all was a nice distraction. When I arrived, I got a taxi from the airport to the mining chemical production facility where my ex-husband worked. One hundred dollars later, I paid the taxi driver. The facility was sprawling and imposing, the kind of place you always see being blown up in action movies. There were strange metal pipes extruding from all structures and going who knows where, as well as a sea of colourful shipping containers. There were two taller buildings, both extremely industrial in their appearance, though the word industrial encompassed this entire facility. Andrew worked in the most normal-looking building here, a three-storey office building from the looks of it. I hadn't been here for quite some time, and this building was new. I headed inside, and to my surprise, was greeted by a receptionist. I was wondering how many people visited a place like this, but realised that the receptionist was talking to me. What can I do for you? The receptionist asked, smiling. He was young, probably in his early twenties. I recognised that smile, common in most people his age. It was as though he'd rather be anywhere but here. I could relate. I'm Sybil Potts. I'm here to see Andrew Rankin. I checked my watch. I have an appointment. He should be expecting me around now. The receptionist nodded and typed on his keyboard. A full minute passed without him acknowledging me outside of that simple nod, and I wondered if I should say something. Just as I was about to do so, he looked up at me and said, You're fine to go up now. The elevators are over there. Mr. Rankin is on the second floor. The receptionist was wearing that same fake smile as he motioned towards the elevator. Thanks, I said, mustering up all the mental endurance I could for this next encounter. No matter how this played out, no matter how civil Andrew was, this wasn't going to be pleasant for me. The elevator music was infuriating. It was as if Andrew had discovered the perfect frequency to annoy me then decided to play it on an incredibly short loop. I was going to get Max and then get the hell out of here as soon as possible. The elevator doors opened to the most stereotypical office I could imagine. There were tiny cubicles lined up along the walls with a few bigger closed-off rooms for the more senior management. Andrew worked in one of these, which was easy to find thanks to the massive, obnoxious sign on his door. I took a deep breath and knocked. Within seconds, he opened the door and greeted me with a thin-lipped smile. Sybil, I wasn't sure if you were going to make it. I clenched my fists. I'd been angry on the way here, but seeing him face to face brought it all back at full strength. I'm on time, Andrew. Where's Max? I pushed my way into his office and looked around for Max. Andrew's office was clean, almost sterile. He had a picture of some woman on his desk, which he flipped over as soon as he saw me looking at it. I caught sight of Max in a cage by the far wall. I ran over. Max, I cooed. Max was clearly happy to see me again, and he did a little dance in his cage. I picked up the heavy cage and walked around to the front of the desk. Now, where are my photo albums? Just on my desk. Andrew said as he walked over to the albums and picked them up. You could have just waited for me to send them to you, you know, he said, still smiling. I've waited months. I barely managed to bury the urge to slap him. Four hundred dollars later, I had to come and pick them up myself. More than that even, since I couldn't do any work today. It isn't as easy as that, he retorted. I can't simply leave work to mail you some photos. I had to wait until I had free time. You haven't had free time once in all these months. It would have literally taken you a few minutes. Just give me the photos and I'll be leaving. I was shaking. 
fine, fine. He threw them at me half-heartedly, and I had to lurch forward to catch them. Is there anything else? He asked, sitting down. Without answering, I shoved the albums into my duffel bag and turned around and left, slamming his door behind me. On my way down to the lobby in the elevator, that same infuriating tune took on a whole new meaning. I hadn't beaten him. This wasn't a competition, and he'd been exactly as I remembered. But I wouldn't have to see him again in the foreseeable future. I'd got my hands on Max and my photos without too much hassle. I smiled at the receptionist as I left, before I noticed a photo hanging on the wall. I took a closer look at it. Several people were kneeling in front of the chemical facility, smiling. It was a typical work photo, with each participant smiling awkwardly and desperately wanting to be anywhere else. What caught my eye was the woman kneeling at the front, smiling what seemed to be a genuine smile. She reminded me of someone I knew. Still, the photo appeared to have been taken years ago. Frustratingly, there were no names. The photo wasn't labelled at all. I deposited Max's cage in my duffel bag on the floor and snapped a quick photo with my iPhone before turning to the receptionist. Do you know who this woman is? I motioned to the picture as I did so. He simply shrugged. Someone upstairs probably does. My smile faded. I found myself knocking on Andrew's office door again, that awful elevator music fresh in my mind. He opened the door. No smile this time. What is it now, Sybil? We don't all have time for conversation. I ignored him and showed him the picture I'd taken on my phone. Do you know who this is? I asked. I jabbed my finger at the woman. He frowned for a moment, staring at the image, and his face blackened. How the hell should I know? Why do you... Before he could finish his question, I had closed the door in his face and was heading back in the elevator, struggling with the cage and the duffel bag. Who was this woman, and why was she so familiar? I didn't know why, but I knew this was important. Whoever she was, she at one time had access to the chemicals here, including cyanide, and I knew I had seen her in Little Tatterford. Chapter 20 I thought so hard all the way on the expensive taxi ride from the factory that I had to take to Advil as soon as I arrived at the airport. I was itching to Google the woman's image on my iPhone, but out here in the middle of nowhere, the 4G phone service was sketchy at best. I had a long wait at the airport before my return flight, so I settled down on a spare seat to find out as much as I could about the mystery woman. There was free Wi-Fi at the airport, and it seemed to be working well. I opened the photo of the woman, tapped the screen, and then selected Search Google for this image. It brought up several images. I wished I was in front of my computer, given that it was difficult on the phone. Some of the images looked completely different and were clearly of different women, in fact, that was the case with pretty much all of them. But I found one that was very similar indeed. I clicked on the photo to go to the page. The page was from an old issue of Antiques and Arts Collectors magazine. The photo was of a woman with a man, and the caption read, Antique Dealers Tim Higgins and his partner Kathy Bradshaw. The penny dropped. Now I knew who the woman was. She looked so different from the woman at the boarding house, with a different hair colour and cut. It was obvious that no one else at the boarding house had known the connection between them. I had discovered the murderer. I had once called the police station, but Blake was out. I left a message on his voicemail, giving as much detail as I could before it cut me off. I tried several more times, but each time got voicemail. That was so frustrating but it was one of the drawbacks of living in a small country town, I figured. I called my ex-husband, Andrew, to ask him if he had heard of Kathy Bradshaw, but he hung up on me before I could speak. I was awfully tired by the time I got back to Little Tatterford. I'd had coffee on the plane, but it hadn't helped much. 
I put Max and his cage inside the van, climbed in after him, and headed straight to the police station. Of course, it was shut, as it was after five, but I hoped someone would be working late. No such luck. Plus, Blake had not called me back. I didn't know what to do next. I sat outside the police station in my van, thinking over the possibilities. There weren't many. Either I went back home, or I stayed in the van all night, or at least until Blake called me back. I was tired and was longing for a long, hot shower, so I decided to go home. Besides, Max had been in that small cage for hours. I was safe from the murderer, surely. She was in the boarding house and had no reason to suspect that I was onto her. I drove past the boarding house slowly and stared at it. There was nothing out of the ordinary. I don't know what I'd expected to see. I drove to my cottage and parked outside it. I sat there for a few moments, collecting my thoughts. After five or so minutes, I tried Blake's phone again. This time he answered. Blake, I exclaimed, did you get my messages? Sybil, whatever you do, do not. His voice broke off. What on earth was he going to say? I figured he must be out of range on his mobile phone. Surely that meant he was heading back to town. There was nothing else for it. I would go into the house, lock all the doors, and wait until Blake called me. As I got out of the van, I was unprepared for the blast of icy cold that hit me. I wrapped my coat tightly around me, huddled down into it, and sprinted for the front door as fast as possible while carrying the cage. I turned the key in the lock, hurried through the door, and then shut it behind me and locked it. I bent down and opened the cage so Max could get out, and then I stood facing the door and rested my head against it, letting out a long sigh of relief. I flipped the light switch and turned around. To my horror, Alison was sitting on the sofa. Worse still, she was pointing a gun right at me. Pretty, pretty, Max said from his position behind Alison slash Kathy on the sofa. Alison, I said, why are you sitting on my sofa pointing a gun at me? My voice was shaking. Alison stood up. I'm sure you've figured it all out by now, Sybil. It's nothing personal, mind you. I think you're a nice girl, but you're in my way. She laughed in quite a scary way, as if she was mentally unbalanced. Let's go. We're going for a drive. Going for a drive? I repeated. Where? Alison simply waved the gun at me. Outside now. You're driving. I'm driving my van, I said. You want me to drive you somewhere? Alison shook her head. You can't be that thick, Sybil. You've watched a lot of crime shows, you're always saying. Come on, move. Outside, now. She crossed over and shoved the gun at me. I walked slowly to my van, hoping to delay until Blake could get there. Mercifully, the van did not start at the first go. I was sorry when it did finally start after a few goes. I knew she intended to take me somewhere and finish me off. Turn right here, she said after we had driven for about a minute. What? I asked. Turn right onto Wheatfields Lane? Yes, turn right and then right again onto the New England Highway, Alison said. Are you deaf? Why can't you tell me where you're going? I asked. It's not as if I'm going to tell anyone else. To Ebor Falls, she said. Ebor Falls, I repeated. I've been there before. I suppose you want to go to the viewing platform at Ebor Falls. I said each word loudly and clearly. Alison nodded and I shot a glance at her. Yes, she said. The waterfall's flowing well especially this time of year. I shuddered and did my best to stay calm. I had been to Ebor Falls before. There was an enormous, fast-flowing waterfall, and a viewing platform jutted out over the steep, deep gorge. It would be easy to throw someone over the platform into the fast-flowing water a very long way below, and they would never be found. 
At the thought, I shook violently, and the car nearly veered off the road. Don't get any ideas, Allison waved the gun at me, and don't slow down, stay on the speed limit. Allison, I know you killed your husband, I said, but she interrupted me. He was not my husband. We were living together, but he refused to marry me. She sounded furious. You killed him because he wouldn't marry you, I said. Allison snorted. Hardly. He was a two-timing cheating pig. We moved to Cressida's to rob her. That place has so many antiques. We didn't think she'd notice a few missing. We've been stealing her stuff on a regular basis. But in the last few months, Tim got cold feet and didn't want to steal any more from Cressida. Plus, he went on a diet and was buying nicer clothes. I figured it was because he was falling for her. I see, I said, slowing down slightly and hoping she wouldn't notice. So you killed him because you were jealous? Allison laughed for some time before speaking. For someone who watches crime shows, you're as thick as a brick. Fancy yourself as Miss Marple, do you? I've got news for you. You haven't figured any of it out. I haven't? I slowed down a little more. I had to delay her to give help time to come. Why don't you tell me why you killed Tim Higgins? I wasn't jealous of him having an affair because I was having an affair. In fact, I've been having an affair for some years. Her tone was triumphant, and I wondered what was coming next. With Andrew. Andrew? I parroted. My ex-husband? I was beyond shocked. Surely this couldn't be true. You were having an affair with Andrew, and you had no idea. She sneered. No, I said. I knew he was having affairs, but that was all. Not affairs, she snapped and waved the gun in front of my face. Only one affair, with me. You're due to get a fortune in the property settlement, and we can't have that. I was struggling to come to grips with the truth, and a dark thought descended on me. You don't mean that Andrew was in it with you? You're slow to catch on, she said. Yes, it was my idea to dispose of you, but Andrew agreed readily enough. You didn't think it was strange that he was so generous as to find you the cottage for rent and pay the first six months? I gripped the wheel. I had thought it strange, but my lawyer had told me that Andrew was trying to look as though he were contributing to me in case we did end up in court. That would then go in his favor in the eyes of the judge. I tried to put the pieces together, but it was hard to think clearly under the circumstances. Alison planned to shoot me and throw me over a cliff, after all. So you and Andrew were in it together? I asked. I've already told you that. We wanted to get rid of you, so Andrew wouldn't have to pay you out in the property settlement. I killed Tim to cover up the fact that we were going to kill you. I didn't think I could be any more shocked, but this latest revelation left me bowled over. What? You killed Tim Higgins just to cover up the fact that you were going to kill me? Yes, Allison said, her tone smug and self-congratulatory. And it was quite a clever plan, if I do say so myself. The police would be focused on Tim's murder, and they would think your murder was tied to that, that you knew something. They would never see you as the primary target. But if I hadn't arrived when I did and hadn't smelled the cyanide, they might have put it down to death by natural causes. That didn't matter, Allison said. They would think his death suspicious after you were murdered anyway. What with two deaths in the same small town? That was enough. We didn't want them to know he was killed by cyanide, though. They never test for it in the usual tox screens. And if they did exhume his body, any traces of cyanide would have been long since gone. 
so I stuffed things up for you by arriving when I did and smelling the cyanide. Allison snorted again. Yes, and no. Cressida had told me that you were arriving the day after you actually did, but she often gets things mixed up. On the one hand, cyanide was a possible link to Andrew, but on the other hand, it was good for us that the police realized that Tim was murdered, as your death would then be more obviously linked to that. What about the painting? Tim had gone back to Warwick to steal it, and the other artwork. I hid the painting in your cottage. Andrew and I hoped you'd be arrested, and it would stop the property settlement. I tried to follow her reasoning, but I was in a state of panic. My palms were sweaty, and I had to keep taking each hand off the wheel in turn and wiping it on my jeans. I was shaking so much that I thought I'd be sick. I'm just turning off onto the Ebor Road now, I said. I don't need the running. Chapter oh. 21 Turn left just ahead, Alison said. What, at that sign that says Ebor Falls? I asked. Yes. Okay, I'm now turning my van off the main road and entering the little lane that leads to the viewing platform at Ebor Falls. You're nuts with your running commentary, Alison said. Perhaps the strain has affected your head. I pulled the van into the car parking area as far away from the viewing platform as possible. Despite the full moon, it was quite dark, as there were no street lights, and there were thick bushes everywhere. I turned off the lights, killed the engine, and just sat there. Get out of the car. I looked at Alison, and in the moonlight I could see her pointing the gun at me. Get out, she continued and walk around the front of the van to my door. Don't try anything. I did so, and could see she was keeping the gun trained on me the whole time. I approached her side of the van and stood still in front of the van. I watched as Alison got out of her door, her gun trained on me. The next thing I knew, she was on the ground. People were calling out and lights came on. I felt as if I would faint, and a strong hand grasped my arm and led me away to a police vehicle. I was still shaking violently and gratefully accepted the blanket someone put around my shoulders. I vaguely watched the commotion as vehicles appeared as if from nowhere, their bright lights streaming into my sore eyes. Someone slid into the driver's seat beside me, and I didn't look at him until he spoke. Sybil, are you okay? It was Blake's voice. I turned to look at him. No, not really. It's quite a shock. Just as well you texted me to say that you were turning your iPhone on and putting it on speaker, he said. Whatever gave you the idea to do that? I sighed long and hard. I know you'll laugh at me, I said, but before I got out of the van to go into my cottage, I had a vision of me doing just that. I had no idea why, but I knew it was important, so I did it. Well, uh, just as well you did. I couldn't see Blake's face in the dark, but I knew his tone held skepticism. Not that I could blame him. I know you don't believe me, I added. Blake chuckled. It's not as bad as what Cressida told me. What did she tell you? Cressida said that Lord Farrington told her to look out the window. She saw Alison sneak out to your cottage, and then some time later she saw your van drive away. She called me at once. But you already knew, I said, ignoring the subject of Cressida thinking that her cat spoke to her. I'd texted you by then. Of all days for this to happen, too, Blake said. The one time we'd all been called to Tamworth, and this happened. I'm just glad you left me a message and turned on your phone before you went into your cottage. I shuddered and blinked back the tears. This could have all gone so horribly wrong. Another officer approached the car and called Blake over. Blake patted my shoulder a couple of times before leaving. I figured it was his way of trying to comfort me. I'll come back soon and drive you home. Constable Wright will drive your van back for you. You'll have to come to the station tomorrow to give your statement. No rush. 
just when you feel up to it. We have your whole conversation with Alison recorded anyway. I didn't remember anything about the drive back home. I slept all the way. It had been a thoroughly exhausting day. I only woke up when the police vehicle pulled to a stop. I staggered out of the car, feeling utterly exhausted. My van was already there. I assumed Constable Wright had driven it as he walked over and gave my keys to Blake. After the two spoke in whispers, the constable left. Come on, I'll get you inside, Blake said. Oh, no, let me go ahead and make sure Max is all right, I said. He can be funny with men. I hurried to the door and opened it and then flipped on the light switch. Max was perched on the back of my sofa. I beckoned to Blake, who hurried in the door. Oh, Max is a cockatoo, he said with some relief. I wondered who Blake had thought Max was, but then the next words out of Max's beak caused my face to turn beet red. Max, that's enough. I turned to Blake. I'm so sorry. I went to Rockhampton today to collect him from my ex-husband. Max never said anything like that before. He was always a very polite cockatoo. You copper, you pig, Max said again, causing me to gasp. I hurried over and picked him up and then took him to the garden room at the back of the cottage. Stay in there, you naughty bird. As I walked out of the room, Max called out after me. Yes, your bum does look big in that. I was furious. My ex-husband must have spent quite some time teaching Max rude words just to upset me. He must have fully intended to send him back to me all this time, along with a new, and shall we say, interesting vocabulary. I found Blake in my kitchen. I'll make you a hot cup of tea before I go, he said. Would you like something to eat? No, thanks, I said. I couldn't handle eating right now. Blake shot me a look of sympathy. Go and sit on the sofa. You've had a hard day. That's for sure, I said. I've had long flights, spoken to my ex-husband, which is bad at the best of times, and then Alison tried to kill me. I tried hard not to cry. My ex-husband Andrew tried to kill me too. I knew he wasn't a nice person, but... My words trailed away as the full import sunk in. I knew my ex-husband was a lowlife, but never in a million years would I have guessed that he was a murderer. I supposed he wouldn't have been able to do the deed himself, but sanctioning it was certainly bad enough. He had agreed that Alison killed Tim Higgins and also wanted her to kill me. A big tear rolled down my cheek. I looked over at Blake, who was carefully stirring sugar into my tea. It was nice to have someone to look after me for a change, to bring me a cup of tea and care for me. Maybe one day, when I was over the fact that my ex-husband had tried to murder me, I would be able to consider dating again. Just as Blake handed me the cup, Max screeched again. You're but ugly! I jumped and spilled some of the tea down my shirt. I'm okay, I said to Blake, who had a look of concern plastered on his face. Thanks for the tea and the ride home. Blake looked awkward. Will you be all right, or should I send Cressida over? No, I'm fine. Thank you, I assured him. My hand flew to my mouth. What about Cressida and Mr. Buttons? Has anyone told them about Allison? Blake nodded. Constable Wright was on his way to do that. Well, if you're sure you're okay, I'll go. Don't forget to drop by the police station in the morning to give your statement. I will. Thanks for everything. With that, Blake left, and I was all alone in my cottage. All alone, that is, except for my trash-talking cockatoo. Chapter 22 the following morning, I was driving back home after giving my statement at the police station. As I passed the boarding house, Cressida waved me down. Lord Farrington says he'd like you to join us for morning tea. How could I refuse? I nodded and parked my car. Soon I was sitting in the main living room at the boarding house with Cressida, Mr. Buttons, Lord Farrington and Sandy. Of course, I had to tell Cressida and Mr. Buttons about the sordid events of the previous day, and it was no fun at all to recount any of it. 
No offence, Sybil, but Lord Farringdon says that dogs shouldn't be allowed inside, Cressida said, although I don't mind. Oh, stop glaring at me, Lord Farringdon. As if on cue, Lord Farringdon hissed at Sandy, who hurried over to slobber on my knee. Mr. Buttons pulled out a white linen handkerchief and rubbed my knee hard. On the upside, I was drinking English breakfast tea out of delicate, fine bone china and eating cucumber sandwiches that were sliced into little triangles and were missing their crusts. The taste was beginning to grow on me. You know, I said, I came to Little Tatterford for a life of peace and quiet. It looks like I might finally get it with all this behind me. Cressida and Mr. Buttons agreed. I supposed Lord Farringdon did too, but he just sat there while Sandy drooled. Mr. Buttons pulled a set of tarot cards from his pocket and unwrapped the cards from their crimson velvet covering. I'll just draw a card. No, Cressida and I said in unison. I'd rather not know, I added, but it was too late. He pulled out a card. A look of horror crossed his face. What's wrong? I asked with alarm. There's some dust on it, he said. How did that happen? He rubbed furiously at the card before placing it back in the deck. Fine, he sighed. That obviously wasn't for the best anyway. He placed the deck back into his pocket, much to the mutual relief of Cressida and myself. I think we've earned more than a little bit of peace and quiet, Mr. Buttons. I'd rather not push fate if you catch my meaning. I gave him the sternest look I could muster. He responded with a small defeated nod and I hoped he wouldn't bring up the tarot cards again. Everything's happened so quickly, I added. It was bad enough before I moved here, but at least people weren't actively trying to murder me. I didn't know what had come over me, but thought perhaps the shock of the last few days was catching up. I dropped my head into my hands and sighed. Sybil, I don't think little Tatterford is full of people trying to murder you. Cressida spoke with a tone that suggested she thought she was being helpful. I don't think there are going to be any more murders. She smiled at me as she said it. I suspected she was probably right. Little Tatterford was hardly a violent town. Still, I'd come here to escape all the stress of my past, and it had caught up in an extreme way. Everything that's happened, it's just, I don't know. My voice trailed away. Mr. Buttons and Cressida both looked at me intently, so I continued. It's as though the town is somehow tainted, for me at least. I'm not sure I can completely relax as long as I'm here, I admitted. Cressida looked upset, but Mr. Buttons maintained his composure. You're not leaving, are you, Sybil? Cressida asked desperately. No, no, don't worry, I managed a little laugh just thinking out loud, and I'm still a bit shocked, I suppose. I sighed again and took a long sip of my tea. Then again, who knows? Maybe this town just isn't for me. After I spoke, we sat in silence for what was probably only a few minutes, but felt like several. If I may be completely honest, Sybil, Mr. Buttons began, and I knew I wouldn't like what he had to say. Nobody begins something nice with a request to be honest. I think that feeling will follow you wherever you go. It has nothing whatsoever to do with the town. You had a horrible experience, of course, but it was the people in this town who helped you out of it. Blake, in particular. He smiled warmly at me, and if I hadn't known better, I would have thought he was suggesting something. Still, I had to admit that he was right, though I would have liked a little credit for saving myself through my iPhone ingenuity, vision-induced or not. I couldn't see myself being in a relationship, though, at least not for a while. My ex-husband had only just tried to have me killed, so I wasn't in the most loving or trusting mood. Just then, panic threatened to overtake me as I worried that this feeling would never pass, but I managed to calm myself down a bit. Would you like another tea? Cressida asked warmly. I really did appreciate them helping me so much. I smiled back. Yes, please.
Cressida nodded and looked at Mr. Buttons expectantly. Oh, very well. He gathered the cups and walked to the kitchen. I heard the electric tea kettle turn on and stifled a laugh. He's right, you know, Cressida said. This town is good for you. These awful things would have happened anywhere you went. It's over, Sybil, and we're here for you. Cressida bent over to pat my knee reassuringly. I smiled and held back the tears. It was all too much too quickly. It was great to have people looking out for me, but it was all still such a shock. Still, it was hard to argue with their logic. Who knows what would have happened if I'd moved anywhere else. Mr. Buttons returned shortly with three cups of tea and placed one in front of each of us. I thanked him and took a long sip, which settled my nerves considerably. Thank you. I smiled at both of them. You're quite welcome, Cressida replied, to which remark Mr. Buttons shot the dirtiest look he could manage. Quite welcome, he all but spat. I tried not to laugh. I didn't mean for the tea, but yes, thank you, Mr. Buttons. As I said it, he shot a smug look at Cressida, though she pretended not to notice. I mean, thank you both for your help. It really means a lot. Well, Lord Farringdon is rooting for you, so what choice did we have? Cressida asked quite seriously. He's typically a good judge of character, you know. I couldn't help but laugh. I'm sure he is. He's always struck me as wise. As I spoke, Lord Farrington busied himself by trying to kill a small spot of light that was coming from the window and hitting the carpet. I leant back into my chair and cradled my tea. It really was a lot more peaceful here, especially now that nobody was actively trying to murder me, though I supposed that was true of anywhere. Nobody could know what was going to happen next, but now I realised that I didn't much care. I was perfectly happy to sit in comfort with my weird new friends, and don't get me wrong, I loved that weirdness, and not worry at all about the future. Visions were all well and good, but sometimes it was better just to nurse a tea and pretend nothing was wrong. Because at that time, nothing was. Everything was simply perfect. The End
You've just listened to Live and Let Diet, Australian Amateur Sleuth, Book One, written by Morgana Best, narrated by Amy Soakes. Copyright 2016 by Morgana Best. Production copyright 2020 by Morgana Best. If you've enjoyed this audiobook, please consider leaving a review and recommending on social media or directly to friends and family. And keep an eye out for other audiobooks by Morgana Best. Thanks for listening.